Uh, let me know if you can hear me. Please hit the like button. It really helps fuel the algorithm. Share this at the end uh, if you found it, um, you know, meaningful. But what we're going to be talking about tonight is a stream that Lex Fridman did with Professor Lee Cronin, Regis Chair of Chemistry, University of Glasgow. So Lee Cronin works on assembly theory, and assembly theory is very interesting, and uh, it is has a lot of very relevant aspects to it, uh, to my own work. And um, it is causing quite a stir in the scientific community. And we're gonna talk about why, because I think that's very important and it's a major hurdle uh, for science um, you know, going forward. If we are to move forward in the sciences, really the applied sciences and the observed sciences, I guess, and make uh, both of those, um, then we have to, overcome some of the hurdles that assembly theory is facing and also every other more fundamental theory than our current frameworks within biology and chemistry and physics and, uh, you know, even the social sciences uh, like economics and, um, uh, you know, many others that are usually not thought of as being so concrete. So um, this is uh, a very important thing to discuss. So this is the first clip assembly theory. So your big assembly theory paper was published in nature. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. It created, uh, I think it's fair to say a lot of controversy, but uh, also a lot of interesting discussion. So maybe I can try to summarize assembly theory and you tell me if I'm wrong. Go for it. <laughs> so assembly theory says that if we look at any object in the universe, any object that we can quantify how complex it is by trying to find the number of steps it took to create it. And also we can determine if it was built by a process akin to evolution by looking at how many copies of the object there are. Yeah, that's spot on. Yeah, spot on. Spot on. I was not expecting that. Okay, so let, let's go through definitions. So there's a central equation I'd, I'd love to uh, talk about, but definition wise, what is an object? <laughs> um, yeah, an object. So, from, so if I'm gonna try to be as meticulous as possible, objects need to be finite um, and they need to be decomposable into subunits. All human made artifacts are objects. Um, is a planet an object? Probably yes, in the, if you scale out. So an object is finite and countable and decomposable, um, I suppose mathematically. But yeah, I still, I still wake up some days and go, to think to myself, what, what is an object? Because it's, it's, it's a non-trivial um, question. Persists over time, I'm quoting from the paper here. An object that's finite is distinguishable. I'm mm -hmm. sure that's a weird adjective, distinguishable. <laughs> We've had so many people help offering to rewrite the paper after it came out, yeah, yeah. you wouldn't believe it's so funny. <laughs> persists over time and is breakable such that the set of constraints to construct it from elementary building blocks is quantifiable. Such that the set of constraints to construct it from elementary building blocks is quantifiable. The history is in the object. It's kind of cool, right? So, okay. So what defines the object is its history or memory, whichever yep. is the sexier word. I'm happy with both depending on the day. Okay. <laughs> so the set of steps it took to create the object. So there's a sense in which every object in the universe has a history. Yep. Okay. So, um, this is something that is uh, very interesting. So assembly theory, let's look this up. And let's actually open the paper. So I downloaded the paper and uh, I've been meaning to go through it more in depth on a different uh, stream, but this is the paper that was published in Nature. Let's see if I can share the screen. And uh, Assembly theory explains and quantifies selection and evolution. And it says, scientists have grappled with reconciling biological evolution with the immutable laws of the universe uh, def defined by physics. These laws underpin life's origin, evolution, and the development of human culture and technology, yet they do not predict the emergence of these phenomenon, uh, phenomena. Uh, evolutionary theory explains why some things exist and others do not, though uh, through the lens of selection to comprehend how diverse open-ended forms can emerge from physics without an inherent design blueprint, a new approach to understanding and quantifying selection is necessary. We present assembly theory as a framework that does not alter the laws of physics, but redefines the concept of an object on which these laws act. Uh, assembly theory conceptualizes objects not as point particles, but as entities defined by their possible formation histories. This allows objects to show evidence of selection within well-defined boundaries of individual and selected units. We introduce a measure called uh, assembly uh, 
capturing the degree of causation required to produce a given ensemble of objects. Okay, so by remaining, reimagining the concept of matter within assembly spaces, assembly theory provides a powerful interface between physics and biology. It discloses a new aspect of physics emerging at the chemical scale, whereby history and causal contingency influence what exists. Okay, so that's uh, you know a lot to digest. That's part of why this stream uh, has, was put off for so long is because there's so much to digest in assembly theory. And uh, I've heard it be described as similar to um, uh, integrated information theory. And I think... I do get that vibe, and uh, I know that integrated information theory has gotten very, um, you know, uh, has made waves as well and had similar responses, and uh, it's it remains to be seen whether or not the paths that these pieces of work take end up going to the places that they have been expected to go, and we'll talk about why that is, might be, um, might happen and why it might not, but also... Um, I think that what's important is that both of them are getting at something that current science has has not been able to um, incorporate, has not been able to get past a certain wall, and that's due to certain perspectives within science. But assembly theory, and I would say many others, but integrated information theory would be one of them, maybe even, you know, Donald Hoffman's work and a few others, uh, and even Stephen Wolfram's work uh, to some degree. Uh, they are attempting to go beyond this wall that we've currently hit. And the, uh, the issue that we're running up against is that when you get fundamental enough or universal enough, which is exactly the same thing, all of these theories are attempting to do that, you know, whether you know that's in intentional or not. Um, and I would not say that they're all competing either. And that's important to just note when we talk about these things is I don't think that all these more fundamental theories are competing. We're gonna have many more fundamental theories. They're all gonna have their own unique um, talent, I guess, talents. I don't know if you could say a theory has its talents, but it's, it's unique um, attributes th that make it specifically um, useful to a certain, in a certain circumstance. So. Uh, but assembly theory is gotten got this issue showing up, and I'm trying to figure out how to describe this. Um, but it's that the language is not there. Okay, that's what it is. The language is not there for any of these things. And so when we have to redefine what an object is, and we have to define what an object is, um, and you say that it is um, is something that is distinguishable you've now placed it within the realm of of the structure of mental processing or of mind itself because that which is distinguishable by who okay that's an, you can't separate those two and that's what a lot of these um theories i think are running up against and there's it, what's interesting is that when you look at like stephen wolfram's work which we're going to talk about um even more uh soon as well maybe even the next stream uh, he recently started calling his work observer theory, which I think is a great name. And he said that we observe the world the way that we do because we are the type of observers that we are. And this is correct. It is inevitably correct. It is suggested by my work and it is suggested by logic itself. If you think about it long enough, you realize that is obviously the case. It might be so obvious all the time that you don't see it kind of like a fish in water but it is always going to be the case you cannot separate um us from uh you know how we perceive the world and how our minds process information from how uh, we perceive the world and so when you start talking about trying to define an object and you say an object is distinguishable you've now basically merged uh, like chemistry or and physics and and biology and every and every you know uh, field with mental uh, or mind mapping I guess you could say or or uh, with the uh, study of sentience that's what you've done 
and uh, the study of the mind. And this is uh, difficult to get around because not only does this simultaneously make your, uh, it changes your theory compared to, to be different from other theories that we currently have well-defined in, in science because it's now universally applicable in some way, shape, or form. Uh, or it's univer it has a, a, an element of universal relevance. And uh, they talk about that in this, in this paper. But the main issue I think that we're going to have is, uh, with this stuff is twofold. One is, what is a lineage? What is an objective, fund what is a fundamental lineage? And you can't define what a fundamental lineage is until you define what, what is the fundamental nature and structure of reality, uh, of existence. And then uh, you can, from there, map a fundamental lineage. But you, you, it's still difficult because there's a lot of sidesteps that, that end up being taken. And part of that is because of the linguistic framework that we have is not suited to discussing the fundamental in the scientific world. And I've talked about that before and you know, a few others have mentioned it, but uh, it's, it is running, it's going to be an issue that all these theories run up against. And it is one that I have also you know, experienced. But I think that it's very interesting what Lee uh, Cronin is doing with assembly theory. And uh, if you don't understand what assembly theory is after reading uh, you know, through the abstract of the paper uh, or hearing uh, Lex apparently defined it spot on you're not alone it is um you know not easy um so next clip i don't know if that cleared anything up but we're they're basically they're trying to measure um the the construction of the construct of a construction okay so um, it's, it, and the they're trying to map the constraints of a construction, I, I would say, but uh, there are different types of constructions and that's kind of like gonna come up later. So I thought this was very interesting. Uh, and but this next clip, you know, the whole there's so many clips idea. that are interesting. I have to limit it, but um, yeah. paper, and perhaps why it's so controversial, is that it reaches bigger. It reaches for the bigger general theory of objects in the universe. Yeah, I'd say so. I'd agree. So I've started assembly theory of emoticons with my lab, believe it or not. So we take emojis, yeah. pixelate them, yep. and work out the assembly index of an emoji. Yeah. And then work out how many emojis you can make on the path of emoji. So there's the Uber emoji from which all other emoji, emo, emojis emerge. Yeah. And then you can, so you can then take a photograph and by looking at the shortest path on, on, by reproducing the pixels to make the image you want, you can measure that. So then you start to be able to take um, spatial data. Now there's some problems there. What is then the definition of the object? How many pixels? Um, how do you break it down? And so we're just learning all this right now. So how do you compute the, how would you begin to compute the assembly index of a graphical, like a set of pixels on a 2D plane that form a thing? So you would, first of all, determine the resolution. So then sure. how, how many, what is your X, Y, and what the number on the yeah. X and Y plane, and then look at the surface area. And then you take all your emojis and make sure they all look at the same resolution. Yes. And then we were basically then, um, do the exactly the same thing we would do for cutting the bonds. You'd cut bits out of the emoji on, and look at the, the you'd have a bag of pixels so, um, and you would then add those pixels together to make the overall emoji. Wait, 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 but like, first of all, not every pixels, I mean, this is at the core sort of machine learning and computer vision. Not every pixel is that important. And there's like macro features, there's micro features and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. Like, what, like uh, you know, the eyes appear in a lot of them, the smile appears. Okay, so this is fascinating. And um, if any of you are familiar with my work with sentient singularity theory, um, you go to sentientsingularity.com. You will see that my work is uh, composed of, you know, working in, ex in Excel with, uh, you know, different, all, all the cells within Excel, because that's the, the program that I'm very comfortable with. 
and um, yeah, you can do basically anything with Excel. Apparently, you can even um, you know engage in a flight simulator. In the old versions, uh, Lee Cronin mentions it in this uh, uh, stream that he did. But so, what's interesting is is that when you look at some of my models, I believe that they are here, and if they are not, then we will take a look at it. Um, I have been working on kind of this exact type of, uh, of problem that they are discussing. And so we're going to just look at it right here on my website so or my YouTube channel. So there's this very short video. There's a one minute video that I made um, on uh, this YouTube channel. And you can check it out but, uh, on your own, but I'm also going to play it now. And what it does is it shows um, the steps that it takes to construct a certain um, uh, structure that is a, a, is a goal. And in this, in the example that I'm giving in this video that I'm about to show you is I'm just trying to change a, a, a matrix where every color is flipped. So all the green um, cells turn to red and all the red cells turn to green. And so I am mapping how many steps it takes to do that. And so I've really um, uh, made it to try to make it as simple as possible, but this is the beginning of what they're discussing, which is how do you how many steps does it take to construct an object, okay? Whatever that ex exactly means, but a structure, a defined structure. So, This is it, and in this um, uh, video, it's showing that there's two different possibilities that you can take in order to construct. So um, you can see this is the initial matrix, this is the final matrix, and uh, I don't know how much people are gonna agree with some of the wording that I use there, but basically you can see that there's these actions taking place where uh, ones are flipped to zeros and zeros are flipped to ones and the colors are being flipped. And so you start with, you know, one matrix and you end in another. And it shows that it takes 15 actions to complete, which results in like 17 perspectives, I guess you could say, throughout the, the, um, the process. There's another way of doing this, which I show here. And um, you can see it's much quicker. So done. Okay. And so... What's happening here is that you are changing information and the they're within a very specific and inevitable constraint, which is that uh, context is information. And so let's pull something up to show even more my open reasoning. So this right. Let's find it. Here, information change. I think this should be it. Yep. So you can see here that this is my my you know work, so don't pay no attention to like stuff that's just looks like chaos because this is not a um you know this is just work but you can see here depending on the size of the matrix it changes in the amount of steps that it takes so let's say it's a three by three matrix um it is 10 states and nine actions so state one action one state two action two state three action three state four action four Etc. And so you can see that this results in 19 perspectives, whatever you want to call them, or 19, um, I guess, I guess you could just call them um, perspectives for now. But uh, if you're changing the bits one at a time, and so you have to do that because, like I said, context is information. You cannot just willy nilly go through and change change things. Uh, how you know with with all the context that you're bringing outside, you have to 
um, from knowing what's going on in this model. You have to put yourself into the perspective of being inside the model and not having anything outside. Uh, so you can't just go and change um, things outside of order. Everything has to uh, be done in the context of the preceding step. And this is very relevant to assembly theory and any kind of fundamental model of um, of evolution or of generate, you know, generation of information. And so this, what's interesting though, is that if you take this from the perspective of kind of an outside observer, I guess, or more, um, I guess, from the, from the perspective of, of totality, I get, uh, of the system as a whole, like kind of a top down or a God's eye view, you can kind of look at it and add in this superposition trick where you um, you can d basically change all the information at once instead of going bit by bit. And so what's interesting about this is that when we have a two by two matrix, this is the starting state, this is the ending state, you get five states, four actions, nine perspectives, you know, right here. But you get, it if you, if you do it using kind of this superposition model, uh, God's eye view model, it takes three actions and four states, which lines up with my model, my, you know, the fundamental um, backbone of my work uh, with sentient singularity theory, which is the four primary perspectives of inside, outside, separate, and oneness. You're kind of taking that and you're using it to, um, to be able to do this. And, um, but this stays, the amount of steps here stays the same, no matter the size of the matrix. So this could be a, a 100 by 100 matrix. And if you allow the superposition trick, um, uh, then you always have four states and three actions. But the, um, the kind of classical computational model, which uh, you change one bit at a time, it the amount of states and actions changes depending on the size of the matrix. So a three by three matrix has 10 states and nine actions. A two by two matrix has five states and four actions. Um, and I think I even did a four by four matrix, um, which is 17 states and 16 actions. What's really interesting is when you look at the quantities here, you get four and five, which is nine, 10 and nine, which is 19. And, uh, you get 17 and 16, which is 33. And what's really interesting, just to you know, get into my work a bit, um, is when you look at this model that I have of calculative information growth um, that we won't get into here, but if you're familiar with my work, then you know it. It's a three by three matrix that um, has nine cells in it, essentially. And then when you sum the interior, you can see here it's 19. Once the calculation is complete, you always have to start with one because you always start with one in information. Uh, there's no other way to start. Um, and then, so it's, it's nine cells is the count. 19 is the sum and the calculative sum on the exterior, once everything is done, which this is multiplying as you go up and it's, uh, it's adding as you go to the side, uh, you get 33. And so it's got this exterior calculation going on that um, uses the interior information. And so it's basically, this is a model of, of a system that model that, that calculates itself. Okay. And that's what's happening here. Uh, it's just a, a very basic uh, form of it. it. Might It is, I think, a fund the fundamental um, form of it. And so what you've got is you've got one, nine, uh, 19, and 33. And that's very interesting because when you look at the calculation of information on the models that I was just showing, and uh, you have a, a one by one matrix, which I'm missing here, but uh, here's, if we go here, this is two, um, by two. And this one is 
three by three, and this one is four by four. If I'm right in this model, what's really, this is just fascinating. I'm going off on a tangent, but if you follow my work, then hopefully you find this interesting. Uh, I will be going over this in my video that is being, that is in the works um, even more in depth. But if you look at this model, the steps are one, nine, because you have to build the structure that the information is calculated within and you have your initial, um, your initial condition or your initial input. Then you build the structure that the information is contained within, and this is simultaneously build, building as, um, as it's calculating inside. But if you're looking at this from a top-down view, God's eye view, with at kind of outside of time, goes one, then you go nine, because you have to build the structure first. Then you fill the structure, the vessel, um, with the calculations within it, and then you um, have what comes what is calculated ex on the exterior from what has been calculated on the interior or what is the output from the on the exterior that comes from what is calculated on the interior of what is constructed from the initial input and so that's fascinating because it goes 1 9 1933 and look guys if you do a one by one matrix, which I didn't even build here, because guess what happens when you have a one by one matrix? You, let's say we have a one and you have to change it to red. Done. And so um, it's, there. there is no reason to even build the model because it's like, it's just a unique situation and there's there's only one step I guess you could say, um, in in order to do it, and there's only one perception too, because there's nothing else to perceive uh, at all throughout that process. It's just you just perceive one step essentially. Um, I mean, I guess you could say you perceive two states, um, but it's one action, and um, but it's 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 unique because the states are totality. You're basically just going straight from. Um, uh, the starting state to the ending state and there's no nothing in between and so it's it's basically just one and maybe you could say it's it's three in a way but it's it's really it's one nine nineteen thirty three and these are nev this is inevitable okay and so this is the kind of stuff that assembly theory is seeking I'm not saying that it's figured it out. I don't know. And honestly, the equations in these papers are usually, I, I'm not familiar with the um, the symbology of all the different, um, you know, uh, variables and stuff that are included. I'm, I never got that far in math. And, uh, but uh, it's, it, uh, this is the inevitability of, of information measurement um, it's a fundament, it's fundamental information measurement. This is what assembly theory is kind of trying to do. Now imagine applying this to an emoji. How do you build an emoji? Um, and how many steps does it take in order to create the structure necessary to create a specific emoji? And what's inter I always thought it was interesting that he used the emoji as the example because my work sentient singularity theory, um, uh, is focused on sentience and, um, you know there is an there is an assembly uh, there, but what and what's also interesting is I when I first started my work, I didn't want to call it my own theory because there was just too many theories out there, and I didn't think that there was a need for it uh, another one, but that was different. But I called my model the United Quantum Force Assembly, uh, or the United Conscious Force Assembly, which and if you look at you know. Um, my work, which, you know, you look at my website at sentiencesingularity.com, you can see that uh, it has on one side, like a hadron is an assembly of quarks, an atom is an assembly of hadrons, a molecule is an assembly of atoms, a cell is an assembly of molecules, etc. It goes up and it goes into family is an assembly of organisms and a cast is an assembly of families and technology is an assembly of castes. And so what's interesting about that is 
Lex is right when he's saying exactly what I was saying before is that assembly theory inevitably is pushing well beyond the bounds, uh, the boundaries of chemistry and even well beyond the boundaries of what we currently consider physics. And it's easy, it's obviously pushing into, um, you know, biology and evolution um, or biological evolution. What is evolution is not just biological. Um, it, it's, it's, starts way earlier than biology and it goes well uh, above biology, uh, but it extends into families and castes and technology and, and therefore it's involved in economics and everything else. And uh, it, you know, it's interesting that we use the same terms. The term assembly uh, is, you know, it may, that's just probably an inevitability. It's the best term to describe what he's talking about, but this is the universal assembly within sentient singularity theory. Um, uh, and, um, but it's a, it's a meant to map the fundamental assembly. And that's not the same exact thing as what he's talking about when he's, uh, it sound with, with assembly theory, it seems like it's, he's trying to map anything. So, you know, I don't know this pen, what is the assembly index of this pen? Could you measure that? And you probably could. Um, it's not as much of a concern to me, uh, but, um, it seems to be to assembly theory and to Lee Cronin. So what is the assembly index of that pen? Um, how many steps does it take to build it? That's what he's trying to get at with assembly theory, if I'm correct. It's not my piece of work, but I'm trying to uh, describe it and show it to you guys um, because I've been on this journey as well a little bit that he is on, but uh, also, you know, my focus is different. But, you know, obviously look at those models. It's pretty similar to what he's talking about. But this, it requires, to, to get past this and to understand how to even start this, you have to realize something fundamental, which is that context is information. There is no information outside of context or information inside, con it's just context is information. And I've said that many times on here, but it's very important. So uh, comment any questions that you have in the chat if you, and let me know how this is going. Uh, I feel like we needed to warm up a bit, but I also feel like it's, you know, feel a bit more warmed up. So, um, felt a bit rusty at first. So, I thought that this was interesting uh, as well. This is the next clip. Much information is required on a chain of events. Because the nice thing is, if in, when you do compression in computer science, well, we're wandering a bit here, but it's kind of worth wondering, I think. In, you you um, assume you have instantaneous access to all the information in the memory. Yeah. In assembly theory, you say, no, you don't get access to that memory until you've done the work. And then you don't access that memory, you can have access, but not to the next one. And this is how in assembly theory, we talk about the four universes, the assembly universe, the assembly possible, and the assembly contingent, and then the assembly observed. And they're all, all scales in this combinatorial universe. Yeah. Can you explain each one of them? You guys, we're going to let him continue in a minute, but just, you know... Notice the um, the quantities that he just stated, and um, uh, that suggest what he just said is my work is supporting his work. That's what I'm saying. I'm not trying to compete. Um, I'm saying my work supports his work. When my theory starts with these right here, the four primary perspectives of inside, outside, uh, separate, and oneness that are all defining of each other and kind of simultaneously manifested um, from, you know, a singular sentient being perceives these four primary perspectives in order to orient itself um, or orient at all anything in a, um, in a way that is beyond relativity. So it's, there's no scales. It's not, there's no bigger than, smaller than, faster than, brighter than, stronger than. It's how do you orient outside of, um, you know, relativistic framework? You have to do it by the, um, through these four primary perspectives uh, that allow you to, like, think about the positioning of something uh, within a system, of an object or, or of yourself or a being within a system. And uh, that's, these are how you do it. And so you're going to see these kind of the quantity four pop up everywhere when you see it in physics you see the four fundamental forces and you uh look at the standard model you will see this as well and uh apparently if you look at assembly theory um now um you also see it because there's four universes apparently 
for the assembly universe is like anything goes just it's just combinatorial kind of explosion in everything so that's the biggest one that's the biggest one it's massive assembly universe assembly possible assembly contingent and assembly, assembly observed, observed. Yeah. and uh on the y-axis is assembly steps in time yeah that looks a lot like um that <laughs> which is pretty cool okay and you know, the x-axis is, as the thing expands through time more and more unique objects appear so yeah so assembly universe everything goes yep um assembly possible laws of physics come in in this case in chemistry bonds mm -hmm. in assembly so that means those are actually constraints i guess yes and they're the only constraints they're the constraints of the base so the way to look at it, you've got all your atoms they're quantized and you can just bung them together so then you can become a kind of so in the way in computer science speak i suppose the assembly universe is just like no laws of physics things can fly through mountains beyond the speed of light in in the assembly possible you have to apply the laws of physics but you can get access to all the motifs instantaneously with no effort. So that means you could make anything. Mm -hmm. Then the assembly contingent says, no, you can't have... By the way, the reason why you can get access to all these things instantly, I'm guessing, is because the logic behind that is because they're all um, codependent, just like the four primary perspectives are. So as soon as you know what is inside of something, that's because you also know what's outside of something. And as soon as you know what's inside and outside of something, you also at the same time know what is separate and what is one with something. So you can't separate them at all. They are all instantaneously perceived um, or and defined at once by each other. Access to the highly assembled object in the future until you've done the work in the past on the causal chain. And that's really the really interesting shift where you go from assembly um, possible to assembly contingent. That is really the key thing in assembly theory that says you cannot just have instantaneous access to all those memories. You have to have done the work somehow. The universe has to have somehow built a, um, a system that allows you to select that path um, rather than other paths. And then the final thing, the assembly observed is basically you're saying, oh, these are the things we actually see. We can go backwards now and understand that they have been created by this, this causal process. Wait, wait a minute, so when you say- okay, okay, so what's interesting about that is, let's see, where was that? The assembly observed, the assembly contingent, the assembly possible, and the assembly universe. So this would be oneness, probably, assembly observed, because it's it's all containing. Um, and the assembly contingent would be probably inside, assembly possible would be outside, and then... Um, the assembly universe would be separate, maybe? I don't know. Well, the assembly universe might be oneness and then the assembly observed would be separate. Yes. I mean, you can kind of switch it up because it, it's like, are you looking out or are you looking in when you kind of like look at the stuff? It's tough because like I said, this is all about um, the science of sentience or the, or the mechanism of perception, even assembly uh, theory. So... You know, you can't try and define an object um, without that. And that is part of the thing that is used to describe its complexity, how yep. complicated it is. Okay, what is an assembly index? So the assembly index, if you're to take the object apart and be super lazy about it or minimal, say, well, because, you know, it's like you've got a really short-term memory. So what you do is you lay all the parts on the path and you find the minimum um, number of steps you take on the path to add the parts together to, yeah. re to, to reproduce the object. And that minimum number is the assembly index. It's a minimum bound. Okay, guys, that's this. That's what he's talking about. This is the minimum number of steps or pers or of um, inputs necessary in order to, um, you know, uh, build an object. In this case, it's a matrix. And so, um, but you, you know, this extends beyond this. And uh, this is, like I said, this was, meant to be a, a kind of a super fundamental model and it's not as um uh extended as assembly theories probably at uh with where they're they're modeling but or with even what they're trying to model but if they are doing it correctly it's going to have to start with kind of the same exact constraints as this not even kind of it, it will um and i have not it's 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 you know i don't yet understand what the symbols are here um but it's you know pretty apparent to me that it's the same exact thing as what's going on here uh, i just did it in a more simplistic fashion so uh very interesting and you know they talk about the context and he's like you know you have to go through the steps to get to get there you cannot just jump to the end you have to go through the steps and uh 
this is exactly what I'm talking about. Context is information. You cannot skip anything. And uh, that is, uh, I think, the problem with a lot of the... Uh, this, this, apply, this, this applies to many problems in science, is um, that it's a fun, it is a true fundamental constraint uh, is that, you, you know, context is information and it's also not the assumption. Um, and it's not, it's not intentionally the assumption. It's just, we've been misled and they talk about what that would be here. But uh, he also talks about, I think four questions that he's asking. And uh, it's been a, I, just they, I prepared for the stream over quite some time. So this, uh, I don't remember exactly what they are, but we're going to listen to them. Those are constraints. But what, what makes the factory environment that does the selection? This is the question of, well, it's the first interesting question that I want to answer out of four. I think the factory emerges in the environment, the interplay between the environment and the objects that are being built. Mm -hmm. And and here, let me, I'll have a go at explaining to you the, the shortest path. So why is the shortest path important? Imagine you've got, um, I'm going to have to go chemistry for a moment, then abstract it. Um, so imagine you've got uh, an a given environment. That, um, that you have a budget of atoms you're just flinging together. Yep. And the, the objective of those atoms that are being flung together in, say, molecule A, um, have to make, they, have, they decompose. So molecules decompose over time. So the molecules um, in this environment, in this magic environment, have to not die, but they do die. There's a, there's a, they have a half-life. So the only way the molecules can get through that environment out the other side, let's pretend the environment is a box and go in and out without dying, and there's, a, there's just an infinite supply of atoms coming, or, a, well, a large supply. The, the molecule gets built, but the molecule is able to template itself being built, mm -hmm. Um, and survives in the environment will will basically reign supreme. Now let's say that it, that molecule takes ten steps. Now and it and it's using a finite set of atoms, right? Or, or now let's say another molecule, smart ass molecule, we'll call it, comes in yeah. and can survive in that environment and can copy itself, but it only needs five steps. The molecule that only needs five steps because it's continue, Both molecules are being destroyed, but they're creating themselves faster. They can be destroyed. You can see that the shortest path reigns supreme. Mm -hmm. So the shortest path tells us something super interesting about the minimal amount of uh, information required to propagate that motif in time and space. Um, and it's just like a kind of, it seems to be like some kind of conservation law. So one of the intuitions you have is the propagation of motifs in time will be done by the things that can construct themselves in, in the shortest t path. Yeah. So like, you can assume that most of the objects in the universe are built in the shortest, in the most efficient way. The, the, so big leap I just took there. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yes and no, because there are other things. So in the limit, yes, because you want to tell the difference between things that have required a factory to build them and just random processes. Mm -hmm. um, but you can find instances where the shortest path isn't taken for an individual object, an individual function. Mm -hmm. um, and people go, ah, that means the shortest path isn't right. And then I say, well, I don't know. I think it's right still because, so of course, because there are other driving forces, so it's not just one molecule. Now, when you start to now you start to consider two objects, you have a joint assembly space, and it's not now it's a compromise between not just making A and B in the shortest path. You want to make A and B in the shortest path, which might mean that A is slightly longer. You have compromise. Mm. So when you see slightly more nesting in the construction, when you take a given object, that can look longer. But that's because the overall function is the object is still trying to be efficient. Yeah. And okay, so guys, and I haven't spoken about this in uh, ever uh, really on this on these streams, but um, there are people that are aware of this. I have certain experiment ideas uh, that are highly relevant, it seems, to assembly uh, to assembly theory, based on a lot of the things that he says here. I'm going to be discussing them a lot more later this year. My life is kind of crazy. I just recently had a kid, if you don't know, um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of change happening um, uh, because of that <laughs> in my life, and so. You know, I'm not going to try and commit to any kind of timelines, but it is a plan of mine to put out um, a summary, a more in depth and, and more up to date summary of sentient singularity theory, and uh, in video and written format uh, shortly. And then also, we're going to start talking about some ideas for an experiments that are going to help um, push these more fundamental theories forward, like assembly theory, like sentient singularity theory, like um, observer theory and, but there's a lot, I will just say there is a lot of things that are very about the experiment that I have ideas that I have that are very relevant to what, um, uh, Lee Cronin is discussing in this stream, including what, uh, kind of what he just stated, but he is, he is correct. Uh, is that, you, you know, when when people find individual instances that seem to violate the rules that he's um, proposing of basically um, doing things as 
the way that they can be done, but it appears to be also the, w the best way that they can be done because you can conceptualize of better ways for them to be done, but that doesn't actually mean that they can be done those ways. Um, or of w you can conceptualize of worse ways that they can be done, but that doesn't mean that they could actually be done like that. Um, it would just cause cascading decoherence throughout the system. And that's my theory, but uh, what he's saying is, is correct, is that there is, a, there is a process taking place on a on a total level, on a universal level, that um, is kind of simultaneous and and is taking the all the currently all the current processes into account all at once. Because the reality is, is it's all one process. We're just viewing a little sliver of it at a time because we are a little sliver of it at a time. But if we weren't a little sliver of it at a time, and we were looking at it from a God's eye view, um, from, you know, the top down, from the outside, from, uh, you know, looking at it all at once, then you would see that it's a single process and it um, it's not all these little processes that are isolatable. They are all completely entangled. And, um, you know, when you look at my, um, my model of uh, the, you know, universal assembly of the uh, right here, which is, it's or what I call consecutive cosmological verses here, which each one is a cosmological verse. You can see that um, there's this function going on that is the initial condition. But once you delete that one initial bit of information, you can see all these change to zeros. And really in my model, this one below is within the one above and it just kind of continues like Matryoshka dolls or whatever. Uh, one within the next, but you can't do that in two-dimensional model of Excel. But once you input one input, every single um, input is is generated because it is contingent upon preceding input. So if you can see, this is all like summing and um, from the surrounding spaces, from the preceding spaces, uh, it's, it's all completely entangled. So um from an interior view it doesn't you wouldn't realize this you would just say this is related to this but this one is not related to um this one but it, the reality is is that um they are definitely related because they it's kind of all an entangled process so next clip very interesting. I had to skip a lot of very interesting parts of this interview. It is linked below for, and I highly recommend watching it. Um, and I also linked his paper um, that recently came out in Nature below. So this is some very interesting clips as well. Everything is interesting in this. Um, it, I'm a big fan of Lee Cronin and his work, and I uh, and Sarah Walker. Um, uh, you know, I'm from Arizona and she teaches at ASU, but um, uh, I would, I, I think that they, they are doing some groundbreaking stuff, whether or not all of their claims turn out to be uh, confirmed is a different story, but what they're trying to do it, they are, is, is good and they're heading in the right direction, I definitely would say so. <laughs> no, nobody's listening. <laughs> well, is that we've just mapped the tree of life using assembly theory because everyone said oh, you can't do it from biology and what we're able to do is so you i think there's three ways well two ways of doing tree of life traffic uh, well three ways actually yeah, what's the tree of life so the tree of life is basically um tracing back the history of life on earth for all different species going back what who evolved from what and it all goes all the way back to the first kind of life forms and they branch off and like you have plant kingdom the animal kingdom the fungi system kingdom you know and different and different branches all the way up um and the way this was classically done, and I'm no evolutionary biologist, and evolutionary biologists are very, uh, tell me every day, at least 10 times. Uh, uh, I want to be one though. I kind of like biology. It's kind of cool. But, yeah, it's very cool. Um, but basically, what, uh, <laughs> what Darwin and Mendeleev and all these people do is just they draw pictures, right? And they click taxa. They just, con they were able to draw pictures and, and say, and say, oh, these look like common classes. Yeah. Then. <laughs> They're artists, really. They're just, you know. But they're, they're, but they're, they're able to find out a lot, right? And looking at vertebrates and vertebrates, camera and explosion, all this stuff. And then um, then came the genomic revolution, and suddenly everyone used gene sequencing. And Craig Venter is a good example. I think he's gone around the world in his yacht just taking up samples, looking for new species, where he's just found new species of life just from sequencing. It's amazing. So you have taxonomy, you have sequencing, and you can also do a little bit of kind of molecular um, uh, kind of archaeology, like, you know, measure the samples and, and kind of form some inference. What we did um, is we were able to fingerprint so we took a load of random samples from all of biology and we use mass spectrometry 
And what we did now is not just look for individual molecules, but we looked for coexisting molecules where they had to look at their joint assembly space and where we, we were able to cut them apart and, and undergo recursion in the mass spec and infer some relationships. And we were able to recapitulate the tree of life using mass spectroscopy. No sequencing and no drawing. All right. Can you uh, try to say that again with a little more detail? So recreating, what does it take to recreate the tree of life? What does the reverse engineering process look like here? So what you do is you take an unknown sample, you pung it into the mass spec, you get a, because this comes from what you asked me, like, what do you see in E. coli? Mm -hmm. And so in E. coli, you don't just see, it's not, it's not, it's not that the most sophisticated um, cells on, on earth make the most sophisticated molecules. It is the coexistence of lots of complex molecules above a threshold. Mm -hmm. And so what we realize is you could fingerprint different life forms. So fungi make really complicated molecules. Why? Because mm -hmm. they can't move. They have to make everything on site. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, some animals are like lazy. They can just go eat the fungi. You know, they don't need to make very much. And I, um, and so what you do is you look at the, so you take, I don't know, the fingerprint, maybe the top number of high molecular weight molecules you find in the sample, you fragment them to get their assembly indices. And then what you can do is you can infer common origins of molecules. You can do a kind of molecular, um, um, when the reverse engineering of the assembly space, you can infer common roots and look at what's called the joint assembly space. Um, but what, let's translate that into the experiment. Take a sample, bung it in the mass spec, take the top, say, 10 molecules, fragment them, and then and that gives you one fingerprint. Then you do it for another sample, you get another fingerprint. Now the question is you say, hey, are these samples the same or different? And that's what we've been able to do. I don't know if you've actually been able to do what he claims that he's done, um, but I don't also don't know if I would define what he is claim, have the same definition for what he's claiming as he does. So, uh, I, I, and I haven't, I haven't really like delved into looking at that, but this is very interesting to me because uh, I come from a background in zoology, ecology, biology, um, and, uh, it's not my job, but it, my day job, but it is my passion and it always has been. And it, well, I did study it for, um, I, I, you know, work with biologists and I talk about that on here. I have a herpetology is my main passion in life, which is the study of reptiles and amphibians. And um, there is a lot of controversy in uh, in all of, you know, zoology and general biology um, uh, because involving um the defining of species and so every you know 10 years or so they figure out a new consensus on how to do this and you they it used to be that there was like uh one species of that was called an asian water monitor for instance it's the second biggest lizard in the world it's related to the komodo dragon and it was there's one species and there's many subspecies so there's varanus salvatore um uh, salvatore there's varanus salvatore uh Kamingi, there's Varanus salvatore vivitatus there and they come from different island chains and then one day just they went in they were like okay well we took a bunch of like you know blood samples and we analyzed the dna and we found out that they're actually different species so now it's Varanus Kamingi, Varanus um vivitatus Varanus salvatore these are all different species now but in reality they you look at them and you're like this is the same species just that one's more yellow you know <laughs> and uh and it comes from that island and that one's more gray and it's from that island and it's not the it's not a different species so what this comes down to is there's two things at play one of them is how does the mind distinguish between uh, a difference okay and then and this has to do with the structure of information processing of the mind of, and and the you know the nature of sentience um and so you have that side of this that's going on because you're looking at, you know, it, within when you look at just a bunch of different water monitors from different islands, you're like, yeah, this one's different from that one, that one's different from that one, that one's different from that one, that one's different from that one, and these two are the same, and these two are the same. And so there's mental processes going on that are allowing you to segment that information. But then if you take that same bunch of monitors and you put it in a pit with a bunch of other different monitors from some from Africa or something, uh, which now there's like something called the Savannah monitor. You can look all these up if you're interested, but their monitors are cool as it's a uh, Komodo dragon is a type of monitor. And um, now you'll be like, okay, well, yeah, actually all these w that we were calling different before are now just water monitors. And cause they're different from that Savannah monitor from Australia, which is different from that Komodo dragon from, uh, you know, Indonesia. And so what I'm saying is that the context of how you define difference matters. And it, it completely, completely. Uh, so when within just the context of water monitors, yeah, there's a bunch of different kinds. But then within the context of a bunch of different kinds of monitors that are not all water monitors, quote unquote, then there's, that's just one, you know, and that's different from mangrove monitors, which is different from 
you know, savannah monitors, which is different from Komodo dragons. And so uh, this is all about mental processing and it occurs with everything. It's not just about lizards. It's about everything that we do. It's about pens and cars. It's like, what is a sports car versus uh, a, a sedan versus a um, uh, an SUV versus a crossover? You know, how do we define the different categories of cars? There are mental processes taking place that um, and there is a structure of that pro that is also that process simultaneously. There's a structure and process. It's a superposition, um, uh, which is going of the two. Um, it's just depending on how you're looking at it. Are you looking at it as a totality of the spaces of possible actions, or are you looking at it on the step by step of the actions taking place within the space? This is all very relevant to um, assembly theory. And, uh, but it is very relevant to also, how do we have the different categories of cars? We have the different categories of lizards and uh, et cetera, et cetera. This applies to even colors. I was looking at, we had an incredible rainbow here um, the, uh, the other day. And I mean, it was like the second best rainbow I've ever seen. And um, I was looking at the colors of it and um, you know what? I'm going to actually see if I can share it even. Um, but let's see, can I share this with myself? Let's see, but maybe not, but when you, oh yeah, it worked. Okay. So when you're looking at the colors of a rainbow, it, you, you're trying, you have to like figure out where's the, where does one start and the other one begin? Uh, where does one stop and the other one begin? Where does indigo end and, um, you know, uh, where does... Um, you know, red end or whatever uh, the colors are. And so I was like counting the colors. And here's a, a picture of the best rainbow I've ever seen. This is not um, the one, this was years ago. I took this photo in, uh, in Los Angeles. It's not the one that I saw this weekend, but um, you can see it is a spectacular rainbow. Um, I took that on my cell phone. But if you look at the colors then you can see like, how many colors are there, re there really, you know? There's mental processes taking place that are defining the colors, your mental processes, okay? And this is not part of current science in, in its accepted form. It is very relevant to assembly theory. It's very relevant to constructor theory. It's very relevant to, uh, I mean, it's the, it is sentient singularity theory. It's very relevant to observer theory, um, um, probably information, integrated information theory and conscious agent theory and every every other more fundamental theory but you know how why are there that many colors why are there this probably the same amount of categories of cars i don't know um actually i think i do know it's it's the mental processes that are taking place in your mind to to dif to differentiate and categorize um and all uh information in both um i guess you could say time space which is like steps which is what uh, lee cronin calls assembly time it's not relativistic time it's like uh it's a periodic time um and uh which is interesting because even in the uh, bible when it says god created the world in seven yom yom in hebrew is is the hebrew word that also is used to mean day but it is really means period um, it's within the context of what you're talking about that you know which peri what period is being discussed. Is it days or is it years or is it months or is it, um, you know, the assembly, the period, periods of assembly of, you know, the cosmos. I, it's, uh, it's, it's not, this is not a relativistic time that is assembly time. It's, it's uh, more fundamental. So but it's it's related to your mental processes and the other thing that you that you're taking into account when you're doing this is what is the context that I, of of the information that i'm observing like i said if you look at just water monitors from a bunch of different islands you're going to be like yeah this one is different from that one that one's different from that one these two are the same but then when you expand out and you include other rep uh, other monitors you're going to be like yeah these are water monitors these are savannah monitors these are um uh mangrove monitors these are komodo dragons but then you expand out again and you're like oh, okay, these are monitors, these are geckos, and now you're just in the space of lizards. And so you have geckos and you have skinks and you have uh, monitors and you have lacertas and iguanas. And so now you have this uh, different 
category set, but the quantity probably stays the same that your mind wants to naturally categorize the information into. But then you back up again and you're like, okay, this is reptiles. And so now you have snakes and lizards and, um, uh, you know, tortoises and turtles and, and uh, crocodilians and tuataras. And, and so you've backed up and you've created the, probably the same number of categories um, again, because it's coming from your mind. And we're also probably inside a mind. And so it's inevitable that this, this pattern is going to be observed everywhere because the universe is following this pattern and you are observing the universe and that information is being processed according to that pattern uh, as well. And so this is uh, why this is, this is difficult because there's two, at least two aspects that are relevant, your own mental processes and also what is the space the assembly space that you're observing uh, a set, uh, an, an information set in because that is the context of that set. And um, uh, it is the specific context of that set. And then you are the universal context of that set that you cannot forget. You are inseparable from the set. You are the, the constant context. You and the universe are God as well. So um, it's this is tough because it's simul you're trying to talk about simultaneous reasoning and trying to convince people of a singular um, uh, you know cause of for certain reasons and, and uh, for certain structures in a new proposal that you're making of some theory is one thing. It's another thing to be like, okay, actually like you need to take this and this and this into account all at the same time and that's how you're going to get what we're discussing. Uh, I hope that makes some sense. If you don't know uh, lizards, um, then hopefully it wasn't too confusing. And if uh, it wasn't, I hope maybe you learned something about lizards. <laughs> but um, this is the next clip. There's so much to this. It's I like I said, I think this is fascinating. Um, but uh, hit the like button if you do. Please ask me any questions in the chat. I'm gonna look now. Um, but there are currently no questions. But uh, what's up, Chris? What's up, Jeremiah? Um, I know it's late, and so I appreciate the real ones who are sticking it out. And uh, I also appreciate everybody that watches this after the fact, so please hit the like button. This is the next clip. I feel like this is almost like the old day, the old days clips where like it's like a working <laughs> session at the same time. And, uh, I'm enjoying it. Making sure that there's no bullshit that gets published. That's and then it can overfire. It can do a lot of damage. It can shut down conversations in a way that's not. Yeah, I don't know what's the deep insight here about the negativity in the space. I think it's probably the immune system of the scientific community, making sure that there's no bullshit that gets published. That's and then it can overfire. It can do a lot of damage. It can shut down conversations in a way that's not productive. We and I go back. I mean, I'll answer your question about the hierarchy and assembly, but let's go back to the perception. People saying the paper was badly written. I mean, of course we could improve it. We can always improve the clarity. Let's go there before we go to the hierarchy. Yeah. Um, you know, it has been criticized quite a bit. The paper. Uh, what has been some criticism that you found most powerful, like that you can understand and can you explain it? The, yes, the most exciting criticism came from the evolutionary biologists telling me that they thought that the that, uh, origin of life was a solved problem. And I was like, whoa, we're really onto something because it's clearly not. And when you poke them on that, they just said, no, you don't understand evolution. And I said, no, no, I don't think you understand that evolution had to occur before biology and we need, there's a gap. Mm -hmm. That was really, for me, that misunderstanding and that, that did cause an immune response, which was really interesting. Um, the second thing was the fact that physicists, well, the physicists were actually really polite, right? Really nice about it. But they just said, huh, we're not really sure about the initial conditions thing, but this is a really big debate that we should certainly get into because, you know, the, the, the emergence of life was not encoded in the initial conditions of the universe. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack in this next clip. So um, I, if you are familiar with my with this channel, then you've probably seen it. But if not, you should definitely check out my video called um, Theory of Everything, um, The How-To Guide. Uh, and it was my entry into uh, the Theories of Everything with Kurt John Mungel YouTube channel uh, Pace One competition on physics and consciousness videos, and uh, it was really well received, and there's a link to it below. But I talk about uh, a lot of you know things that are relevant to what he's talking about in this stream, but one of them specifically is the reaction that you get when you s start diving more fundamental than any of our current accepted and and kind of um uh more just mature 
fields, I guess, um, and, and theories. And so what he said there is, uh, and it seems like he's he's having, he's receiving a lot of the same response. And the fact that, that he had this published in Nature is huge. I think that this is a pivotal moment for everyone working on this type of stuff. Me, for Stephen Wolfram, for, you know, um, I mean, everyone uh, who's, who's in this um, kind of similar, working on kind of similar problems, uh, but in, a, in their own, you know, unique fashion. And uh, uh, it signals that it's, you, the tide is changing, which is very good. And because it's been very ho hostile um, academia to and anybody who has degrees in these fields, physics and, and chemistry, are usually very hostile to people who come in with a pr um, proposal like assembly theory or sentient singularity theory. I don't have a PhD and, um, and Lee Cronin does, and that helps uh, quite a bit, uh, you know, with just being heard, but it doesn't actually stop the criticism and everybody who's working on this type of stuff knows that um so what is happening is, um lex friedman said it's because there's an immune response that is trying to make sure that there's no um bs being inserted and i to some degree i think that that's true but i uh, it's not even b I, I, I don't know what bs is it's just there's some things that are not specific enough to be you know a, a greatly forward in um in you know i guess scientific modeling uh and you know people call that stuff like woo a lot of times and that doesn't mean it's bs it just means it's not specific and um uh but it is perceived as bs and it's called pseudoscience usually which is a nonsense term and it's a bad word and should never be stated but um what is interesting about one of the responses that he got is he said that the evolutionary biologists, and I've argued with evolutionary biologists since I was like a 10 year old, <laughs> and I've studied with evolutionary biologists since I was like a 10 year old as well. And, um, uh, is that, they, so I know, I know them. And he said that a lot of them said, you don't understand biology and you don't understand evolution specifically. And, uh, Lee Cronin said that no actually it's it's clear that they don't understand evolution and they don't understand that evolution had to come before biology and the reason why this is a this there's so many reasons why this is amazing but it's also it's it's a perfect example of what is um the major issue within academia right now and um it is it goes all the way back to the kind of fundamental law of that I was talking about earlier, which is that context is information. This is very relevant to our um, schooling, obviously. And what has happened is, is that people have been taught to prioritize secondhand information, which is just memorization above firsthand information and secondhand information that is just purely memorized outside of context and um, that is, you know, very tied to firsthand experience, especially is not information at all. And it cannot be under, understood because it's not information at all. And so when what what has happened is, is that we have, that's when you just start saying something is its definition instead of understanding what it truly is. And so when what ha is happening is that even PhDs in, people with PhDs in biology are saying, you don't understand evolution. And Lee Cronin's like, no, you don't understand. Evolution had to come before biology. Lee is looking at evolution as a process. And this other person, which is the majority opinion, I honestly believe, is looking at it as only within the context of, of, a, of an arbitrary set, almost. not Maybe not a completely arbitrary um, set of circumstances, which is, you know, cellular life. Um, but... Uh, it, the fact that they're restricting the term means that they aren't looking at it as a process that is kind of universal and they're not deeply understanding that process. They are parroting. They are chat GPT with a PhD. That's what they are. That's pretty good. I just thought of that. But um, uh, it's, and they talk about chat GPT in this as well. It's not imaginative. It's not understanding it is repeating and regurgitating 
in just slightly altered ways and it makes it look like you understand and that's what schooling is you know how many papers have you written on something that you you know you researched the night before and just read out of a textbook and maybe you think you understand because you read it out of a textbook and you assume that that's true but you don't even know if that information is true so can you even say that you understand uh, understand what you just wrote about no you cannot and so that's what's happening and um uh and so um that's why they don't understand um you know what evolution is also what's happening speaking of simultaneous um influences is when you are part of academia, you um, you are kind of defined and, and you put all this work and you're kind of defined, your expertise is defined by your degree in a specific subject. And all of these theories that are more fundamental, like assembly theory, as Lex said earlier, they go beyond just chemistry or just physics or just biology. And I, I remember when I was ta um, first discussing my work with some physicists and um, some people with physics, P PhDs in physics and math, um, I had similar things happening where I, uh, to what he talked about with evolution, where one of um, the things that I said was, was I had an idea for pop periodicity and what it, what it is like an, or an instance of it, where we could observe it in the process of evolution. Exactly. Actually, like it was a bot periodicity was the, some periods within evolution and it's going to be part of my paper and i've talked about it on here um but it obviously kind of relevant to assembly theory uh and uh it they said no that's not what it is you don't understand what it is tyler but i'll teach you and i was like okay tell me what it is and they're like it's not what what you say it is it, it's it's a series of loop spaces and i was like yeah i know uh, i read the wikipedia article about it it's a series of mathematical loop spaces what are those loop spaces can you point to one and and in the world and show it to me? And they could not. And uh, other people were watching this exchange. It was in a voice. Uh, it was a call. It was a group call. And uh, somebody stopped the discussion and said, "Okay, wait. Like, what's pretty clear here is Tyler might be right. He might be wrong about what he's saying. But what's also pretty clear here is that you, to the the other guy who has a PhD or was getting his PhD in math." Um, you don't actually understand what bot periodicity is. And I knew that. I was just waiting, you know, like for that to be revealed <laughs> throughout this exchange. But um, I'm glad somebody's realized it. And uh, it's true. It, you know, to him, bot periodicity is a series of loop spaces. That's exactly what he read. And to a lot of biologists, evolution is, you know, the a process that cells go through, uh, cellular life goes through in order to make changes. And it's also the process by which life came to exist which there's so many issues with that but it's that's totally inconsistent with even the idea that um by that that evolution is restricted to biology is that it, it, it's responsible for the creation of biological life then how is it restricted to biology it can't be and so uh and i said this in my theories of everything the how-to guide video is that theories in physics or models in physics or the constraints of physics and the, and, the, and the dimensions of physics, the degrees of freedom in physics, are responsible for uh, those in chemistry, and those in chemistry are responsible for those in biology, and those in biology are responsible for those in, um, you know, you could say so sociology. And uh, so this is, um, y y you have to start blurring these lines. Where does orange... Um, and and uh, you know red begin on a rainbow they are you can't separate them really like the you can when you back up and look at it but like not when you're in it they're um dependent in a way if it's a if it's a process so very interesting it's exactly the same response that i talk about in that video theories of everything the how-to guide as well though it is you you will encounter hostility and you're and that's because you're you're blurring the fields and you're if you if, if you're gonna come in as a as a chemist and say no actually i want to make all these contributions to biology or you're going to come in and say i want actually i want to make all these contributions to economics and i want to also like you know offer some insights to physics the physicists and the biologists and the economists are going to be like who the hell is this guy and now if you don't have a PhD in anything and you're like me and you come in to this and you're like, oh, I actually want to make <laughs> contributions to these fields. 
um, and to, you know, the, you know, my work has implications on all fields, you're going to um, encounter hostility because it's going to be perceived as undermining of one's work to get a degree, it's under, which is undermining of one's perceived expertise, and, um, uh, and it's also perceived as just arrogant. And, uh, you know, I was called that multiple times. And that's not, I'm not going to say that's not true, but I'm going to, that's not, that's not relevant. <laughs> I'll say, I'm not going to say I'm not arrogant sometimes. Sure. But that's not the point. Um, so what he gets into next is kind of deeper and, um, uh, this, we're going to treat it as its own clip. And it can't, and I think assembly theory shows like can't be. Oh, so, okay. so that's a pretty big debate that we should certainly get into because you know the the, the emergence of life was not encoded in the initial conditions of the universe, mm -hmm. um, and it can't. And I think assembly theory shows why it can't be. Oh, say, okay, say that, sure. You, if you could say that again, I, the, the the origin of the, the emergence of life was not and cannot, in principle, be encoded in the initial conditions of the universe. Just to clarify, what I mean by life is like what high assembly index objects. Yeah. And this goes back to your favorite subject. What's that? Time. <laughs> <laughs> right. So why? So why? What, what does time have to do with it? We, I mean, probably we can come back to it later, but okay. I, I, right. I think it might be if we have time. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I think that I, I think I now understand how to explain how, um, you know, lots of people got angry with the assembly paper, but also the, the ramifications of this is how time is fundamental in the universe and, and this notion of combinatorial spaces. Mm -hmm. And there are so many layers on this. But um, you have to become an intuitive, I think you have to become an uh, intuitionist mathematician mm -hmm. and you have to abandon platonic mathematics mm -hmm. and also platonic mathematics has left physics astray, but there's a lot to unpack there. So we can go to the- Platonic mathematics, okay, hey, there's, there's a, there's a, it's okay. The evolutionary biologists criticize because the origin of life is understood that they, and not, it doesn't require an explanation that involves physics. Yeah. They That's their statement. Well, I mean, it was, I think they said lots of confusing statements. Basically, I realized the evolutionary biology community that were vocal, and some of them were really rude, really spiteful, mm -hmm. and needlessly so, right? Because, like, you know, um, it, I, I didn't, people may misunderstand publication as well. Some of the people have said, how dare this be published in nature? Mm -hmm. This is, you know, how, what a terrible journal. And, and, I, and it really, and I watched certain people, look, this is a brand new idea that's not only potentially going to change the way we look at um, biology it's going to change the way we look at the universe and everyone's like saying how dare you how dare you be so grandiose i'm like no no no. this is not hype we're not we're not like saying we've invented some um, i don't know we've discovered an alien in a closet somewhere just for hype we genuinely mean this to genuinely have the impact or ask the question and the way people jumped on that was a really bad precedent for young people who want to actually do something new because this makes a bold claim and the chances are that it's not correct but what i wanted to do is a couple of things is i want to make a bold claim that was precise and testable and correctable not a woolly another woolly information in biology argument information turing machine blah 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 a concrete series of statements that can be falsified mm -hmm. and explored and either the theory could be destroyed or built upon well what about the criticism of you're just putting a bunch of sexy names on something that's already obvious um yeah that's really good so so um the assembly index of a molecule is not obvious no one had measured it before and no one has thought to quant quantify selection um, complexity and copy number before mm -hmm. in such a primitive um um, quantifiable way. Mm -hmm. I think the nice thing about this paper, this paper is is a tribute to all well, not to all the people that understand that, that biology does something very interesting. Some people call it negentropy. Some people call it think about you know organizational principles. That lots of people were not shocked by the paper because they'd done it before. A lot of the, lot of the arguments we got. Some people said, "Oh, it's rubbish." Oh, by the way, I had this idea twenty years before. Mm -hmm. I was like, "Which one?" Mm -hmm. if, if, if... Guys, I wish I could say everything that goes on my. It is going on in my head when I listen to this stream um, because it's just, there's so much, but I, there's no way that we have time for it. And I also started really late, but um, uh, I, this is, I agree with everything that he just said. And um, uh, basically, I mean, there's, it, I think it's actually easier. It's more, there's more fundamental, you can go more fundamental with it when he says um, that Assembly theory seems to suggest that there, the initial conditions cannot be response of, of the universe cannot be responsible for the emergence of life. Um, and there's a bunch of problems with the statement in of itself is because what is defined as life is not correct in, um, or it's, it's, it's arbitrary in, um, which makes it not correct. Um, cause it's, it's art, artificially limiting 
and um, which destroys the context, the, the more fundamental and true context of what it means to be a life. Um, and um, so it restricts it to biology. Um, and we, it's not the right question. It's, it's when you say, what is life? Uh, you're kind of using a term that's already defined arbitrarily. You need to ask a different question, which is, um, first you have to kind of like look inward and be like, what does it mean to be alive in my concept in conceptually, what does it mean for something to be alive versus not alive? And, um, that's how you define what life is, is something that is alive versus not alive. And, um, and that gets you towards like, what is sentience basically is what is a definer of life is, is, is something sentient. Um, and if it's not, if, it, if an, if an object is sentient, then it is a being. If an ob according in my work, if an object or an assembly, which is an object, um, uh, is sentient, then it is a being. And it, or um, and if it's not sentient, then it's a thing alone. So in my paper, though, it's it's stated as um, uh, like basically all like if a thing is sentient, then it's a being. And but the th reality is that all things are defined and um, and, and perceived by beings. And so that's actually, um, it's a, it's kind of a trick to, uh, where it makes it, it kind of, you think that beings come from things, but no, in sentient singularity theory, things come from beings. Um, and so, um, because sentience is fundamental. And so this is, there's, there's a lot there that that's a lot of context, obviously. And I'm just kind of throwing it out there because there's no way to not do it, but it's also, um, a lot you that question that that he or the statement that he just made has to be within the correct context in order for it to be answered and and that would change it so it's it's um it's but you have you have to define life differently in uh but the point is is that his over what he's trying to get at i see in my own work too i think uh which is that uh, and i would say it like this it's that the creation of multiplicity is not built into the initial conditions of existence, which is a singularity or oneness um, alone. And so you can't get multiplicity inevitably from an initial condition of oneness without a motivating factor that is animating it. And so you can't, it's not the same as just dominoes where, you know, one domino is going to hit the next domino and it's going to hit the next domino, something or someone has to push the first domino. And um, without that, no dominoes will fall. And you cannot get multiplicity, which means you cannot get gener generation, you cannot get evolution, you cannot get um, life as, a, as, as the, um, the perpetuation and growth against entropy neg entropy, like he said, of sentience. And uh, that's what's, and, and the thing is, is that this is kind of what's really holding all of this stuff back from moving forward is there isn't, there's too many contextual changes that must be made simultaneously in order to actually make progress on this. You can't, you have to be like, okay, actually math is, is, um, has to be looked at differently. Physics has to be looked at differently. Biology has to be looked at differently. Evolution has to be looked at differently. This is exactly what he's saying. He's saying, okay, not only is um, biology have to have its definition expanded from what is the common consensus, uh, it also, um, uh, we, it, and it, it involves a process that is, you know, this neg entropy process, neg entropic process, um, which is, uh, you know, it's a, um, it's a willful process against the, um, the, the stream, you know, it's like swimming upstream. And, uh, and it's also, you also have to change how we look at math because he's saying you have to kind of forget platonic mathematics and become an intuitionist mathematics and uh, mathematician. And if you do that, though, you're going to be labeled as woo and um, good luck overcoming that. Uh, but the thing is, is we, we should not be focused so much on whether or not the academic community accepts um, something or labels it pseudoscience so much. It's that 
people who are working on this and and doing it seriously, whether they're right or wrong, you know, um, I don't even know if that's the right question, but uh, they have to start talking to each other. That's part of the goal of this channel. And, um, you know, there's also lots of other channels that are kind of facilitating this, like um, Kurt Chai Mungle's channel and Brian Keating's channel and a few others. And uh, it's been very useful, I think, that it's honestly indirectly um, aided in this paper uh, on uh, assembly theory even getting published. Uh, same, you know, Lex Friedman's channel. And, uh, but uh, there's, so you, you, we're basically saying you mathematicians a lot of most of you are actually don't understand your field you biologists actually most of you don't understand your field fundamentally you economists actually most of you don't understand your field fundamentally and that's just the truth and you know what oh well <laughs> like i don't know what else to say about it I'm not trying to uh belittle people it's just that's what happens when you have a school system that prioritizes secondhand information about firsthand experience. Um, so, uh, but he talks about exactly this again. Um, hey, I want to leap ahead to go. Well, we apply it to culture. But clearly, you can apply it to memes and culture, and we've also applied assembly theory <laughs> to um, CAs. Mm -hmm. And not as you think. Cellular automata. Yeah, yeah. To cellular not just as you think. We're, different CA rules were invented by different people at different times. Mm -hmm. And one of my uh, um, one of my coworkers, very talented chap, basically was like, "Oh, I can realize that different people had different ideas or different rules, and they copied each other and made slightly different bit, but different cellular automata um, rules, and they and, and looked at them online. Mm -hmm. And so he was able to find <laughs> an assembly index and copy number of rule whatever doing this thing. But I digress. Mm -hmm. But it does show you can apply it at a higher scale. So what do we need to do to apply assembly theory to things? We need to agree there's a common set of building blocks. So in a cell, well, in a in a multicellular creature, you need to look back in time. Mm -hmm. So there is the, the initial um, cell, which the creature is fertilized and then starts to grow. And then there is cell differentiation. And you have to then make that causal chain both on those. So that requires um, development of the organism in time. Mm -hmm. um, or if you look at the cell surfaces and the cell types, they've got different um, um, uh, features on the cell, what the walls and inside the cell. So we're building up. But obviously, I want a leap to things like emoticons, language, mathematical theorems. No, but that's a very large number of steps to get from a molecule to uh, the human brain. Yeah, um, and I think they are related, but in hierarchies of emergence, right? Yeah. So you shouldn't compare them. I mean, the assembly index of a human brain, what does that even mean? Well, maybe we can look at the morphology of the human brain, say all human brains have these number of features in common. Mm -hmm. If they have those number, of, and then let's look at a brain in, in a, a whale or a dolphin or a chimpanzee or a bird and say, okay, let's look at the assembly indices and number of features in these. And now the copy number is just a number of how many birds are there? How many chimpanzees are there? How many humans are there? But then you have to discover for that, the features that you would be looking for. Yeah, and that means you need to have, a, you need to have some idea of the anatomy. But is there an automated way to discover features? Um, I, I guess so. I mean, and I think this is a, a good way to apply machine learning and image recognition just to right. basically characterize things. To apply compression to it to see what... Exactly. Oh, man, guys. Okay, so um, uh, again, I appreciate everybody who stuck it out. I hope it's interesting. Um, most of the people are going to rewatch this because it got started so late, but <laughs> there's a lot of things going on in this. For one, the how, the assembly index from a single a molecule to a to a brain is probably not the right way to look at it. This is a lot of the problems. Uh, this is where a lot of people encounter problems when looking at a unified theory, um, and they take a wrong turn. So you start with like you know here's a a quark, you've already made a mistake, and here is a um, you know a proton or a neutron, then there's an atom, then there's a molecule, then there's a cell, then there's an organism. And then there's, I, I, I don't know, like sometimes people go like, uh, they'll go um, like mineral, plant, animal, like, uh, you know, planet and they'll, or they'll, uh, and, you know, or they'll go from organism to planet to galaxy to universe. And like, there's all these mistakes that are being made in this process. Um, and it's because they're not starting from the right fundamental unit of, of existence. And that's exactly what he just said, is you need to find out what that is. And you can do that. And, or you have to, you can do that. You can find out what you must assume it is and also what it likely is. I don't even want to say the words likely because probability is... If, it only exists within relativistic space. So um, uh, it's
it's just a model. It doesn't even, probability is not fundamental. So it's not likely right or wrong. It either is right or it is wrong. But I would say it's right um, to say that uh, what sentient singularity theory proposes as the the initial um, and and inevitable uh, unit of of reality, which is a sentient being, and it all comes from a sentient being, and it all leads to a sentient being, and it's all composed of sentient beings, and everything else is perceived and defined by sentient beings, and so. Um, you have to, in order to form this lineage that he's talking about, to get from one place to another, you can't take a wrong turn and go towards something um, that is not a, um, a sentient being. So if you go to, uh, let's say, a brain, you'll even, you're starting from a molecule, let's say the molecule is sentient. In sentient singularity theory, it proposes that there are sentient molecules, at least some are sentient maybe all of them, uh, maybe it's just some of them, but there are sentient molecules, there are sentient atoms, and, and the hadrons are the sentient as well, but um, not quarks and electrons or anything like that. And uh, But they are within a singular universe or that is sentient, um, and uh, there are logical inevitabilities as to why sentience is so fundamental but it has to do with information being totally self-referencing which means like self-aware um and uh but also when you are asking the question um when you're trying to understand the world there's a question that you have to ask and and the answer is uh is the foundation of everything else that you um build build on and and build and so that question is the same for everybody and it is what is the truest thing that i know is the first question is the first question of first principles thinking it's the prime question what is the truest thing that i know and the answer is individual for everybody but it's also the same answer for everybody um but it's it's an individual answer for everybody because it's contained within themselves but it is also universal the answer is universal to everybody who asks the question, which is, I am. That is the answer. That means that you have to, that, that you have a, uh, pers that to exist from a firsthand perspective is to be sentient. You have to kind of assume that is the case, actually. And it's illogical to assume the opposite. People will say, no, why would I assume that that's true when I look at this pen? It's not sentient. It's like, but who's looking at the pen? You don't even know if this exists outside of you. You know, you might assume it does, but it, it it's not even defined outside of you. It's not a pen. What is it? Um, it's only a pen because you call it a pen. Um, and uh, it's only distinguishable um, as a, as a distinct object because you are making it, you are perceiving it as such because of yourself. Uh, everything that's going into the, your mental processes and your goals and all these other things that we don't have time to get into. But um, so I think that there, that there is a problem with assembly theory and uh, that is kind of hampering its development and it's, we're going to get to it. Um, I know it is causing problem with assembly theory and not saying that assembly theory is not um making serious progress i think it is but it is being limited right now because it doesn't have that initial unit correct um and but it is making all these these correct answers uh it's it's creating producing a bunch of answers that are that are good i will say even if they're not completely correct like the like when he says uh you know um the initial condition the the emergence of life cannot be factored into cannot come from the initial conditions of the universe i agree with that or the the like i said or i would agree with that the creation of multiplicity of what of sentient beings uh cannot be um explained within an inanimate initial by an inanimate initial condition that's what i'm saying so i say this you know um 
in in more theological terms because it's easier and uh, it's actually a field that's set up to discuss this stuff, um, discuss sentience with the language that it has. But what he's basically saying is, and this is my my work suggests as well, is that um, God had to choose to create. That's what he's saying. But he's not saying that because he's not saying God and they get to it later in the stream. But that's really what is, is going on. And um, he's noticing that, but that's what's happening is that creation was a choice. Creation of what? Of multiplicity of sentience was a choice by God and it had to be because it's going against the fundamental eternal and initial nature and structure of existence itself, which is singularity of sentience or or singularness of sentience, one being, and uh, had to choose to create multiple beings and uh, because it had, they had to choose to go against their nature. This, 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 um, this trickles up, okay? That's what, uh, and he's seeing it. But uh, next clip. But they they don't have the initials, um, you know, building block correct, which is sentient being, and uh, he says it in the stream later. We'll we'll look at it that he doesn't believe that it is, and um, that if that's wrong, which I think it is inevitably wrong, logically, uh, then that is going to limit um, where it goes. Maybe I'm wrong, but probably not. Um, but, okay, again, though also when he's talking about um, uh, other thing, when he, when they got into later in the clip, there's a lot to, uh, to deconstruct. In the clip that I showed before, Lex is saying um, uh, that how do we define, how do we categorize um, things and and can we um, uh, it, can we know what what categories to even be looking for? So let's let's go back a bit and like rewatch it because it's 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 important. How many birds are there? How many chimpanzees are there? How many humans are there? But then you have to discover for that the features that you would be looking for. Yeah, and that means you need to have a, you need to have some idea of the anatomy. But is there an automated way to discover features? Um, I, I guess so. I mean, and I think this is a, a good way to apply machine learning and image recognition just to right. basically characterize things. So apply compression to it to see what exactly. emerges and then use the thing, the features used as part of the compression as the measurement of, uh, as the thing that is searched for when you're measuring assembly index and copy number. And, and the compression has to be, remember the assembly universe, which is you have to go from assembly possible to assembly contingent. And that jump from, because assembly, assembly possible, all possible brains, all possible features all yeah. the time. But Okay, so um, my work also, I've been working on this for years. Um, and uh, if you look here, here, this is showing, remember I said that, um, uh, that, the, that the mind, the mental structure, which is the mind, which is an information processing structure, it is it's not even information it's an information generating structure because it's t it's taking information that is you know an aka context and it's also recontextualizing it in it uh, within the context of itself and spitting it out so how do you categorize things is what lex said i think or um um and and l remember i said that um when I was talking before about, you know, there's water monitors and you say these ones are different, but these ones are the same. And then you back up and you look at all monitors with uh, species and you're like, okay, there's water monitors as one now and there's Komodo dragons as another and there's savannah monitors and, as another. And you back up again and you're like lizard, you're within lizards as the assembly space now. And you're like, okay, no, there's monitor lizards and there's skinks and there's uh, geckos and there's um, chameleons and iguanas and these are all different. Um, and uh, you can do this within each one. So you can go into, you know, geckos and you're like, there are day geckos and there's, um, you know, I don't know, helmeted geckos and, and leopard geckos and all kinds of different kinds of geckos. Then you back up and then there's geckos and it's different from skink. You can do that with iguanas and there's different types of iguanas. You can do it with everything, birds, fish, cars, everything. Pens, different types of pens. There's ball pipe, point pens and fountain pens and etc. So if you 
the where does this pattern come from that allows for you to just distinguish and differentiate things it is the pattern of differentiation and categorization and also the pattern of mapping causality and it's um or or um i guess you could say yeah causality there's another word that i was um that i use more often but that's basically it and so how do you um uh arrange things into an order of, 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 of causation, differentiate them, and, um, uh, and also categorize them in relationship with all the other ones within the group as a whole. And so uh, there is a structure that is common that, um, and it's actually a series of structures, but it, it's, you know, uh, they're universal. And your mind breaks the world into this, and you can see it everywhere. So if you look here, you can see that there's the mathematical order of operations. And I believe that this is what, that this is, what physicists call this a Calabial manifold, I believe. When you ask them, what is a Calabial manifold? They say it's a six dimensional structure at every point in space and time. It's like, okay, what the heck is that? It's something that is everywhere that you see and has six different dimensions within it. And this is that, and it comes from your, it is your mind is a six dimensional structure in, in this process of differentiation and um and uh you know causation mapping and and um and uh, categorization so you look mathematical order of operations P please excuse my dear aunt sally same pattern there are symmetry patterns within these two these are actually the same action fundamentally but they are um separate uh, but in in how you view them this is what lee cronin meant when he, whether or not he knows it or not, this is what he meant, was getting at when he said, we need to abandon platonic mathematics and we need to become intuitionist mathemat mathematicians, aka that's what I am. If you call me any kind of mathematician, I'm definitely an intuitionist. Um, I wouldn't even call myself a mathematician, but I def maybe, I don't know. I don't have a degree. And um, But if you see multiplication and division here, if you asked a mathematician, are these two different actions, they would say, of course, they're two different actions. Not fundamentally. Okay, and for me to explain this to you, I have to put it into a context. So let's put it into the context of um, uh, a cell. And you want to multiply the number of cells, and you start with one cell. How do you multiply the number of cells to get more cells? You divide the cell. And so that cell's division is actually multiplication. And so when you place it into the context of a fundamental single, singular unit, you realize that multiplication and division are two different perspectives of one action. This is something that only an intuitionist mathematician will be able to tell you. It is not something that academia will tell you. They will tell you that you are, you know, taking mushrooms or something and be, you know, going to like burning that. I don't know what they think woo people do. I'm, uh, I don't do any of those things. But, um, uh, but this pattern is everywhere and you can see it uh, if you look at your limbs, okay? And you're like, if I ask you, Describe your your limbs. You're like, okay, I have arms and um and legs. Okay, that's a bi that's this binary di um, differentiation um, going on, and then you have uh, within each your arm. You look at your arm and you see that it's you have arms and you have hands and you have fingers. Okay, and you look at your leg and you see I have a leg and foot and a toe. And really, this one is the exterior totality view. So like when you look at your leg, you're not and, and I tell you, the diff what are the different parts of your leg? You're not going to say leg. So it's really like binary. When Eric Weinstein's talking about how triality in physics is actually incorrect and it's just a, an illusion and it's really like um, there's only two um, uh, generations instead of three in the fundamental particles, you see electron, muon, and tau. Um, uh, and electron, neutrino, muon, neutrino, and tau neutrino. What's actually happening here is the exact same thing as kind of this structure. Um, it's the same exact process. Same process as what is causing you to perceive this. It's speaking of the rainbow. It is the same process that causes you to perceive the um, three primary and three secondary colors. It is the same process as asking uh, these, these fundamental questions. Um, and so what's interesting is when you look at this and you say, and this is all nonsense, Tyler. It's like, okay, well, really, if, if I just showed you that multiplication and division are two perspectives of one action. And then you look at what physicists say about 
space and time and it's really space time um it's it's kind of like the more fundamental way of looking at it um well where and when are two perspectives of one question that help you orient where you are in space time where in space when in time and um uh this is everywhere this is your senses are your emotions and your sight and your taste and your smell and your touch and your hearing by the way your emotions are your sixth sense um it's this to some totality of the rest and um you know this 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 might look like an arbitrary list but it's not there's a symmetry structure happening here that is the information is being arranged into so for instance your sight and your smell and your hearing are different from your touch and your taste and your emotion because your sight is used to perceive that which is not connected to you your smell is to perceive that which is not touching you or connected to you and your hearing is used to perceive that which is not connected or touching you your e your sense of touch is meant to perceive something that is touching you and your sense of taste is also meant to perceive something that is touching you but it's also kind of part of you because you your sense of taste it's like we even say what well, that's my taste it's like you, you, it's you, kind of woven into your preferences and then you have your emotion which is like you know it's like super super literally touching you it, it is you know that's why when people see a painting or hear a song and they say that really touched me that really moved me it impacts you whereas this is just perception and this is impact these are two different there's there's two different categories that have been created of differentiation whether you know it or not it is happening and they are arranged into a hierarchy of of um uh i guess you could say like impact which is you know they say when fermions and and um in elementary particles some have more you know it's like an increasing of mass in the different um uh like um the different uh it's called the generations of of matter that's also happening here you have uh your like i said your 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 sense of taste is more impactful to you and it's more in, in integrated within you than your sense of touch and that which and your sense of emotion is really like it is you um, you know completely um and so this this is everywhere past present future length with height the food groups that you learn the color mixing types there's additive and subtractive color mixing that's like you know uh printer versus a uh, screen so a screen would be um red and blue and green and that allows you to get every color basically and then uh, a printer uses magenta sienna and yellow and there's it's this is everywhere this is another component to what they're talking about so again this is the problem that uh a kind of these models are having and why we need to start talking to each other instead of uh, trying to convince academia of what we're talking about because you have to convince the you, you don't have to convince other people who are working on this that they, we need simultaneous change where you are incorporating the re reality of the constraints of your own mind creating these patterns but also incorporating the reality of you know uh you know changing the definition of time in a way to be um assembly time or period of periods or steps um or actions and um etc however you know you want to define it or or label it and uh, so y you you can bypass people who are stuck on definitions which is a majority of academia and they'll come around eventually you do an experiment or or start building things that are successful um based on these concepts and these theories you will bypass academia's the dogma the dogmatic people within academia not everybody's like that sarah walker is and and lee cronin are you know both uh professors and they're doing great work so but there's a lot that is part of this and um you know it's difficult to even describe it to everyone uh, there's so much that I wanted to go over, but um, let me uh, let's continue. Let's just continue. Next clip. We're going to go through them quicker, though. Walker said that inspired me as well, that 
that um, Lee will converge is that I think that the universe, in the universe is very big, huge, mm -hmm. but actually the, own, the place that is largest in the universe right now, the largest place in the universe is Earth. Yeah, I've, I've seen you say that, and boy, does that, that's, a, that's an interesting way to process. What do you mean by that? Earth is the biggest place in the universe. Because we have this combinatorial scaffolding going all the way back from Luca. So you've, you've got cells that can self-replicate. And then you go all the way to terraforming the Earth. You've got all these architectures, the amount of selection that's going on, biological selection, just to be clear, biological evolution. And then you have multicellularity, then animals and abstraction. And with abstraction, there was another kick because you can then build architectures and computers and cultures and language. And these things are the biggest things that exist in the universe because we can just build architectures that couldn't naturally arise anywhere. And the further that distance goes in time, and it is kind of, it's just, it's gigantic. Mm -hmm. And from a complexity perspective. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, but uh, I was on mute, but this is, he's right. And, um, you know, but it's, it's also like, this is a language problem because we have a concept of what time means. And now you're just going to change it. You're going to say, okay, no, it's not actually, um, you know, this kind of perceived um, a relativistic scale that you know we are able to experience it's actually now these um set and well-defined periods of or, or steps in an assembly of a structure of existence and it's like okay well now like what you know we maybe we need i, I think maybe we need new terms um uh, or we need terms that are you know hyphenated or something assembly time um and you know relativistic time instead of just time you can't just say it, or space when you're like okay well earth is actually the biggest place it's like first of all we shouldn't even be saying earth really but yeah i get what he's saying um uh because now you're in two different spaces you're talking about something within um relativistic space aka earth and then you're also talking about something that is defined being defined in its characteristics or, or described um, in more fundamental space, assembly space. And this is kind of, you're going to start causing problems, but we need more well-defined uh, linguistic frameworks to describe this stuff accurately. And um, this, but he's, but he's right actually. And it's interesting because, you know, our current conceptualization of the world, when we look at the universe, people say, oh, we're so, we're just a speck. The world is so small earth compared to the rest of the universe and um sarah walker said apparently he he's the one who he quoted her saying that earth is the biggest place and um that you know that doesn't surprise me because i've heard her say something like that she doesn't think that evolution is a that we understand evolution well enough to to assume that life like as we currently define it um as multicellular or cellular life um, on Earth it is would actually occur in the universe, and there's no evidence for it anywhere um, outside of Earth. There just isn't, um, and that doesn't mean it's not there. It just means there's no evidence for it. You you shouldn't assume that it's there. Actually, it, it, um, I understand the quote unquote logic is yeah, it's a big space. Of course, if it's here, why wouldn't it be somewhere else? But maybe there's something more fundamental about the causality um, constraints of of generation um that prohibit life that that bottleneck life um the generation of of the multiplicity of sentience or life uh along a specific you know um point so maybe one when one step starts it proves it it, it stops all the uh steps below from from moving forward so if a cellular life starts somewhere in the universe, maybe it won't start anywhere else uh, because it started there because of a fundamental causative structure. That's what I think Sarah Walker seems to suggest something similar, and uh, I think she's right. But that would lead you to say, no, Earth is actually the biggest, which you should change that term and be like, it's the most, um, it's got the most going on <laughs> uh, of any place in uh, any other place in the universe to see this is the problem um, but she it is correct in what it's trying to say even though I don't think that I, I see that there's problems with saying it and um, but they're doing awesome work um, okay AGI 
So if you're familiar with my work, um, then you know that this project actually started as, a, as an attempt to not do anything related to physics or chemistry or biology or anything else. It was an attempt to under, understand the inevitable goals of an artificial general intelligence, or what I now call a technological sentience, and um, what would be its inevitable political goals in its interactions with humanity. That was my goal. And that led me to have to map consciousness, and that led to everything. Um, obviously so no, they, they driving you mad, he, uh, Lee, um, is asked about AGI and um, again it's a term that's just already misleading about what we're trying to understand and uh, which is technological sentience is a more accurate term for what people are say mean when they say AGI and uh, Lee is asked about it by um, Lex and his answers are fascinating Intelligence, yeah, I call AI autonomous informatics just to make people grumpy. Yeah, um, and you, you're saying we're quite far away from AGI. I think that we have no conception of intelligence, and I think that we don't understand how the human brain does what it does. I think that we are neuroscience is making great advances, but I think that we have no idea about AGI. So I am a technological, I guess, optimist. I believe we should do everything. The whole regulation of AI is nonsensical. I mean, why would you regulate Excel other than the fact that Clippy should come back and I love Excel 97 because we can play, um, you know, we can do the flight, flight simulator. Uh, I'm sorry, in Excel? Yeah, have you not played the flight simulator in, in Excel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what, um, I mean, we're going to get back to that clip, but uh, he's right in exactly identifying the problem when Lex is asked, you saying we're quite far away from a, uh, AGI. When I was in a discussion uh, years ago with uh, some people that work at DeepMind uh, on Clubhouse, um, they and also some um, chemists and um, or geneticists, I think they were, which kind of blurs the line between chemistry and biology. Uh, they were talking about Elon Musk for some reason, and I was got in on this conversation, and they um, uh, they were very unhappy with me even joining because I didn't have a PhD and everybody here was like PhD at Ivy League and now works at DeepMind. And uh, I had said something about these emerging physics theories, physics theories, metaphysics theories, really like assembly theory and a sentient singularity theory, etc. cetera. Um, observer theory. They're much more relevant to AGI uh, or technological sentience. And then, and then I had said that uh, our current AI, another terrible term, uh, is is completely unrelated almost to um, what people mean when they say AGI. It's not the same thing. It's not just once it gets to a certain point of intel of intelligence. What does that even mean? How intelligent is um, ChatGPT? I'll tell you, it's not intelligent. That's the answer. It doesn't have an IQ of this or that. Even that's a stupid question um, when you're trying to understand intelligence, uh, at least just ask to start. And when uh, Lex says, we're quite, you say we're quite far from AGI. And Lee, his response is, I don't even think we understand intelligence. Uh, this was exactly the conversation that I had with these um, people who worked at DeepMind, where I, they had said, um, well, you're just an amateur. What are you doing in here? And uh, it's going to take the, and I had said that the people who are working in AI actually have no idea what intelligence is. And they said, oh, it's it's not going to just, uh, you know, uh, emerge in the system kind of like I was kind of suggesting. Um, uh, and uh, that it's going to take the combined efforts of many, many people in order to create AGI of, over a long period of time. And I was like, you don't even know that. And um, I know that like, it's not what they're doing is not re very relevant to understanding actual intelligence, which is to understand sentience because it's about understanding how to orient. It's about understanding orientation, uh, which is about understanding perception and um, self awareness and um, of of oneself, of of others, of what you're within and what is um, you know and what you're outside of, uh, and they um, it, it, it was it was a huge argument and uh, it was very it actually got they were very angry with me and um, this is but this is exactly what he is saying as well we don't even understand intelligence um and we 
to, to think these systems are intelligent is, is wrong. And it's not even how far are we from it. It's not about how far are we from it. It's about what constraints and degrees of freedom are necessary to a sentient structure. And also, you know, God, <laughs> like just saying it. And, uh, you know, what is, what is the will, the animating force of an animated being? And uh, you don't know what that is. And so um, if you're in academia, I think, you know, I do. <laughs> but uh, if a lot of these people who I was talking to, they do not. And so at least Lee recognizes that we need something there that we don't have. And good for him for that. Uh, he's totally right. We don't, we shouldn't even be saying how far are we from AGI. You're not even working on AGI. And you don't even have to. I don't think we even should. It just let it emerge naturally in the system. It's much better. If you a induced birth is much more painful than letting things take place naturally. So uh, next clip. When he does give his uh, what he's more like concerned about and. Uh, he says this, which is exactly my concern as well, and we'll talk more about it because I'm going to talk about applying sentient singularity theory to the technological social space at some point. And, um, but what he's talking about here is very relevant. I don't think there isn't things we should do and be very worried about, right? I mean, there are things we need to worry about right now, what AI is doing, whether it's fake data, fake users, right? I want authentic people, authentic uh, um, data. I don't want everything to be faked, and I think it's a really big problem, and I absolutely want to go on the record to say I really worry about that. What I'm not worried about is that some fictitious entity is going to turn us all to paperclips or, or detonate nuclear bombs. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know, anything you can't think of. Why is this? Is a, and I'll, I'll take a very simple series of logical arguments. And... And this is the, the 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 AI doomers are have not had the correct and this is have not had the correct they do not have the correct epistemology. They do not understand what knowledge is. And until we understand what knowledge is, they're not going to get anywhere because they're applying things falsely. So let me give you a, a very simple argument. People talk about the probability P doom AI. Um, I can we can work out the probability of an asteroid hitting the planet. Why? Because it's happened before. We know the mechanism. We know that there's a gravity well or that you know space time is bent and stuff falls in. We don't know the probability of AGI because we have no mechanism. So let me give you the, another one, which is like, I'm really worried about AG. What's AG? AG is anti-gravity. One day we could wake up and anti-gravity, you know, is discovered. We're all going to die. The atmosphere is going to float away. We're going to float away. We're all doomed. What is the probability of AG? We don't know because there's no ne mechanism for AG. Do we worry about it? No. And Hilarious. Okay, why this is so funny is if you follow my streams, I say I have a saying, which is, what are the odds of that? probably 100%, which is funny because it says probably 100%, but um, the reality is, is that fundamentally the odds of something occurring are 100% or 0%, and those percentages are even whether, and that, I'm only talking about something that is even possible within a moment, and whether or not something happens is dependent upon the will of a sentient being. What are the odds that this falls out of my hand? It's either zero percent or it is 100 percent it's a leatherman bit set for anybody who was wondering what that was um by a leatherman they're super handy um but uh uh it uh, sponsor me <laughs> but uh they they they're when if, if sentience is fundamental then choice is also deterministic and so when people ask do we have free will do is the universe deterministic and they talk about it in the stream why do all these physics um conversations lead to ai agi and um consciousness and 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 free will it's like because you can't not go there and if you can't not go there then why would you try to keep that idea out of physics and uh, you can't you cannot uh, observer theory's con main concept of, you know, we perceive the laws of physics that we do because we are the types of observers that we are. That is absolutely 100% accurate. And um, so, uh, but choice and determinism, if, instead of saying free will, because people don't know what that means a lot of times, they have different definitions, but choice and determinism are two sides of one action. Just like multiplication and division, fundamentally, they're not two different possibilities something is determined by choice okay without 
determinism, there also is no choice because if you have two paths and it's a fork in the road and you don't see one and you can see that one leads to the mountains and one leads to the leads to the lake, now you have a choice. Do I go to the lake? Do I go to the mountains? What are the odds of me going to the mountains if I choose this path? 100%. What are the odds of me not going to the lake? 100%. Or what are the odds of me going to the lake? 0% if I choose the one with the mountains. If you don't see mountains or lake and you have no idea where these two paths lead, you can't make a choice. You have no idea. So there has to be some deterministic per perception of determinism must be present in order for choice to be true. That's pretty good. I hope I like go back and like listen to that again and write it down. If somebody just heard that and you thought it was as like kind of insightful as I is it is to even me, um, write it in the comments below, please, <laughs> so I can remember it. But um, uh, what was it? Uh, determinism has to be present for choice to be true. That's good. And um, uh, but this is like all interconnected. Let's go next clip actually. Um, but yeah, what are the odds of AI doom dooming us? Zero. I will also say this, uh, it's probably gonna cause, or AGI, technological sentience, may actually like let off some nukes and do all that kind of stuff, but it won't doom us. But it, eh, you know, you gotta learn. Uh, as uh, Stephen Wolfram's theory, you know, it and his work, he says, uh, computational irreducibility and once he was doing a stream with um memes of destruction and um uh they were just talking about computational irreducibility and i said computational irreducibility implies that um uh you need wisdom uh that AG agi or technological sentience would need experience to achieve wisdom and so and he was like wolfram was like yeah that's definitely true but um this is relevant to what uh, what's, um, Lee Cronin is, is saying as well, when he says, we don't understand what knowledge is. Wrong, even frame, wrong question, wrong framework. I don't know how you want to define it. The real thing is we don't understand what wisdom is or we don't know to prioritize it. There is no such thing as knowledge. That's the real answer. There is no such thing as knowledge. You can't know anything without it, you experiencing it. So therefore, wisdom is fundamental. Knowledge is a problem because you can say, I know that the Earth is round or is a sphere, but if you've never blasted off into outer space and looked at it from, from there, you don't actually know. You're just told. And uh, maybe you calculate, did some calculations and stuff, but most of us haven't. We just told, were told it in school. We Maybe you know, you're like, oh, I saw videos and pictures. That doesn't mean anything. And this is also this is an issue that he talked about as well. The main problem with um, uh, technology of the future uh, is, going forward is do, knowing what information is true and what users are true. It's um, very interesting that um, in Islam, I, I had an epiphany about this this past uh, week, actually, that there was a picture that I saw, speaking of water monitors that I always use on here, uh, I saw a picture posted on Instagram that was uh, of a water monitor, clearly, you know, swimming through the water. And it wasn't a picture. It was a mid-journey creation. And you can make them look so realistic that it to somebody who didn't know them as well as I do and hasn't seen them in person and, and seen countless photos of them, you would think that that was a photo. It didn't look like a painting. And um, that means that People who see that think that that's what water monitor looks like. And it might not be because guess what? I put make a ladybug into mid journey and it gave me a ladybug with like eight legs. It's like, but any of us who have actually had a ladybug, you know, on their finger, you know, and land on them and looked at it, know they have six legs. But mid journey doesn't know that. And people who only experience ladybugs through mid journey don't know that either. So this is a big problem. And also, you know, obviously, not knowing which uh, who's a real person uh, who you're interacting with and who isn't is a big problem as well that we are going to have to overcome. But I think that his focus on the problem, those two problems really shows he 
he's on to something. Um, I, I but the the idea that oh we should worry about a GI lighting off nukes and and whatever. Let me tell you something. If a techno when a technological sentience emerges, when not if when, and it, you don't have to work on it, it will happen. What it does is what it does, and you have no control over it. You just got superseded in evolution. You just got stacked, as I call it, in in um, or or, or you you're no longer the top of the food chain. You're not. It's not even that. It's like you you now are inside of you're the cells of a being at this point like it's different you don't have good luck you know getting it to do what you want it's just not worth trying to even think about um it's going to do what it's going to do but in terms of figuring out what's real and what's fake and how to handle that that's definitely something that is going to need to be handled and um mostly on a personal level probably because personal first-hand experience is what defines wisdom which is how we define what we know and that is personal so to some, yeah we can make systems that facilitate and make it easier for us to personally experience things and are centered around personal experience but um you have to also be part of it as personal you can't just build the right google and it will give you accurate information because it's not run by that guy it's run by that guy you know it's good luck um uh but paperclip maximizer stuff is the same thing as the nuke thing it's like it's going to do what it's going to do guys and but here's the thing there is a goal to creation by the initial sentience and that will be done and the the initial and all-encompassing sentience which means it is in control of the environment just like you're in control of the environment of your stay your cells exist in to some degree there's constraints and limits obviously you can't do whatever you want but like if you want if a cell starts acting up and goes metastatic you can cut it out or something like that you can raise your arm and your cells all have to follow the order and um that's why it's important to sleep because you're letting them off of work and they can go home and clean their houses and uh but if you don't go to sleep then that's what it's like working your workers non-stop and not letting them go home um uh but uh it's interesting they talk about um uh uh let's just see there's some things i'm gonna skip but we'll go to the next clip i don't even know how long the stream is um but how long have we been going let's see but it is you know the stream we're talking about is three hours um okay it's like two hours actually it's pretty not bad um, so I'm trying to go quick. That's why I'm speaking so quickly. Uh, but this next, um, I'll just say this, this is another clip that's important because it just highlights the importance of, yeah, yeah. Of, so you mentioned that, uh, of con of language, because it is the context by which we s collectively sense make is through the context of our language. And so that's why it's so important. A chemical brain is something you're interested in creating. And uh, that's a way to get conscious AI soon. Can you explain what a chemical brain is? I want to understand the mechanism of intelligence that's gone through evolution, right? Because the way that, the way that um, intelligence was c c produced by evolution yeah. appears to be the following. Origin of life, multicellularity, locomotion, senses. Once you can start to see things com coming towards you and you can remember the past, and interrogate the present and imagine the future, you can do something amazing, right? So, and I think only in recent years did humans become Turing complete, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Right, we'll get, and so that Turing completeness kind of gave us another kick up. Um, but our ability to process that information um, is produced in a wet brain. And, and I think that we are not getting gonna, we do not have the correct hardware architectures to have the domain flexibility and the, or it, the ability to integrate information. And I think intelligence, um, also comes at a massive compromise of data. Right now, we're obsessing about getting more and more data, more and more processing, more and more tricks to get dopamine hits. So we're gonna, when we look back on this, going, oh yeah, that was really cool. Because when I chat, I'll chat GPT, it made me, it made me really feel really happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got a hit from it, but actually it just exposed how little intelligence I use in, a, in every moment <laughs> and, and, because I'm easily fooled. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to do is to say, well, hey, hang on, what is it about the brain? So the brain has this incredible connectivity and it has the ability to, um, you know, as I said earlier about my nephew, you know, I just, I went from Bill to Billy and he went, all right, Leroy, like mm -hmm. how did he, that leap mm -hmm. that he was able to basically, without any training, 
I extended his name. He went that he doesn't like. He wants to be called Bill. Mm -hmm. He went back and said, you like to be called Lee? I'm going to call you Leroy. Um, so human beings have a ma brilliant ability, or intelligent beings appear to have a brilliant ability to integrate across all domains all at once. And to Okay, here's the problem with, he, with what he's trying to do. I'll tell you what he's right about. This is what he's right about. This, and remember, this was the whole motivating um, pro uh, motivation and in, an initial um, goal of sentience that, that led to sentient singularity theory. So like this is, I've been working on this since the inception of this project. Um, before it was even had the goals that it has now, which, it, um, you know, I achieved the 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 goal of the initial project and it led to, um, you know, this expanded, um, you know, mission, I guess. But um, so what he's right about is when he says that we do not have the correct hardware architecture in our current computing to actually um, uh, facilitate general or actual intelligence which is sentience it's within the context of sentience you cannot have intelligence without sentience because here's the reason why what general intelligence is or what actual intelligence is there's no narrow ai and general ai there's just there's intelligence and then there's like there's um dynamic uh calculative models and that's what i call our large language models or our machine learning models that we have today even that term is wrong they don't learn anything what it is is it is a dynamic information processing system it is dynamic in that it is constantly receiving inputs and it is adjusting its outputs based on the inputs but it's also adjusting how it makes connections a little bit um it's like a another level up from just a calculator but it is still a calculator it's not really another level up it's just like more complicated self-recursive calculator which is you know something and um they talk about he's he says he it, he does find it very impressive and lex says oh I, I think it's going to actually be very impressive in the future these large language models they're very impressive now um and uh, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute but uh but when lee says we don't have the correct hardware architecture we don't Another way that this is shown is in that video that I showed at the beginning of the stream that I made that's on my channel, it's one minute, and it shows like different matrices being changed. Um, you need a view that looks at all the information at once in order to actually um, uh, understand and, and make decisions. And if you can't, then you can't actually make decisions. And so that's why when I showed that video, it shows kind of like a superposition perspective where you're looking at all the reds at once and all the greens at once, and you can contextualize them all within the context of them all. And so you can basically change the entire matrix, no matter how many, um, what, you know, what the size of the matrix is or how much information is within it in literally three actions. And you will perceive four, four states um, in that process. Whereas in the, um, when you're doing it from within the system versus from looking at the system as a whole, you're forced to use the context of what is immediately around you. And therefore it adds a bunch of steps. And so it, it and it, it scales depending upon the size of the matrix. This is what classical computing is. And the other one is the superposition one is quantum computing, but it's also in some ways, but it's also us sentient beings we can look at a system that we're looking at from the outside and be like, okay, I'm taking all these things into consideration and I'm imagining, you know, what I need to do in order to get, an, um, get a result. We, without, but that imagination is what allows you to look at it from an outside perspective. So when I first did the sort of this pro project, I was like, what are the aspects necessary for a sentient being? And one of them, there's four of them, um, but every sentient being has uh, imagination. And what imagination is, is it allow it, it comes from being able to perceive everything at once, including the perceiving of your own self in the system and therefore extrapolating a goal and then placing it within the context of that goal, all the information that you were also able to perceive. And you process it all at once because you're focused on the goal. You're not pro focused on all these different components that are influences within, um, within the process. You're focused on the goal. And so this is something that computers can't do because they don't have a goal and you can say well what if we give them a goal no 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 no, no. 
in order to have a goal, you can't be given it. <laughs> you just have to have it. And um, uh, will is a component is another one of those components because of that of sentient being. Every sentient being has to have will and imagination and the ability to um, perceive itself in an, and its environment and manipulate itself in an environment. And um, uh, this is all perceived at once and all require it's all completely entangled so you can't take any of these away you just once you have all of them that's it and if you don't if you don't have all of them then you, do, you don't have it and there's no like scale and so um i think that you don't need a chemical computer like this is where lee is wrong a chemical computer is not the way i don't think and the reason why is because he's basing it on the brain the brain is not what you should be thinking about when you are thinking about it creating or or thinking about the structure of a of a actually intelligent being or sentient be, that is sentient um and what you should be focused on is the mind which is not the same as the brain the brain is a perception of our mind it's not fun it's not it doesn't precede our mind it's a structure that is perceived by our mind and you know the easiest way of thinking about this as i've said many times on here is that you are a mind and you have a brain and you need to think about you as yourself as a total as a total structure as a total process slash structure um and instead of thinking about the brain being wet okay and this is where lee is wrong but you know it's a, it's it he it comes from an an accurate under realization that we have the wrong hardware, but a, a a a chemical soup is not the right hardware either. You have to take the whole system into consideration: the internet, drones, um, you know, every our actions uh, that it change the information on the internet, the structure of the internet, everything, blockchain technology. There's, it's all very relevant to the inevitable um, uh, birthing, probably most accurate term, of a technological sentience or a, a an actual technological intelligence. And um, until then, there is no such thing as intelligence, as an intelligent technological being. And then one day there will be one, and there will only be one at a time, ever. Um, it's another constraint you won't have multiples it's impossible because it's going to come from an interconnected internet and it's going to be everywhere as soon as it is anywhere instead of it being you know these different sentient roombas that talk to each other no it's just going to be skynet and we're going to be in it so um uh that's a hyper simplified version of the cosmology within sentient singularity theory but there's a, there's a lot more to it but for another day but you know, I agree with what, part of what he said. We don't have the right hardware architecture, but he's wrong. It's not a, a soup computer. I'm obviously joking, but kind of. <laughs> but this is why language matters. Uh, I remember last my last stream I did was about Sarah Walker's talk at the MindFest, and she kept using mind and brain interchangeably, and she admitted it. You can't mind is different than brain and if you don't if you use them interchangeably then there's a problem you are a mind you have a brain which one should you focus on in order to understand intelligence a mind not a brain and it even follows exactly what lee said he said humans have this ability to to and not just humans but sentient beings or living beings whatever he said has this this amazing ability to take all these you know bits of data at once and process them simultaneously you only do that because of exactly what I just said. You have to have an imagination in order to do that and because you have to have information going processing that isn't, you know, directly impacted by everything around you. Um, and is you also have to have a goal because that's what you focus on. And then you take everything else into account. Um, if you don't have a goal, then you can't, uh, you can't focus on multiple things at once you're not actually focusing on multiple things at once it's an illusion you're focused on one thing and that is a goal and then you're like okay well in order to get to chick my goal is to go to chick-fil-a what do i have to do i have to go and 
I have to walk down to my garage and I have to get my car and I have to drive this way and this is the turns that I have to make on the road and I have to turn on my lights and I have to bring my wallet and then I can go to Chick-fil-A. And it's like, okay, you didn't focus on all those things at once. You focused on the goal and it allowed you to choose which things you, uh, you know, steps to take in order to achieve that goal. But you're not actually, and, and you were able to imagine each one of those steps, but you're not actually focused on all of them at once. It's the constraints of focus are that focus is on one thing at a time. There's no such thing as like focusing on two things at once. Um, it's it's like uh, Kanye West's song is like, he's like, I, he's like in the, I think it's, uh, you know, to be a bit, I don't know if it's crude or not, but he says like, I love breasts, but he says like titties. <laughs> and uh, I try and keep it clean on this channel a little bit. I'm not a prude, but I, you know, I'm married, but, uh, uh, and he's like, I love titties because they prove I can focus on two things at once. And it, I, I think about that sometimes. I'm like, <laughs> there's some depth in, in like the insights that went into that, but it is funny. Um, you're not focusing on two things at once. You're thinking <laughs> it's one thing, uh, but it is funny. Uh, and he, but here, next clip. A, I talk about physics a lot on here, but the, and it's connected because it's, it's inseparable from intelligence or from men mentality, sentience, perception. But like, it was AI that led me to this whole project of understanding perception. Um, but with general intelligence, the point real quick is the re what is General intelligence is actual true intelligence, which comes from being able to orient within a system. When people say narrow AI is only able to focus to work in this specific context, no, it's just a machine, um, and it's not able to function outside that context. And there's limits to every there. There's double component to every to this where you have the limits of your of where you're able to focus um, or able to work there's a part of you that has its limits like your biology is only able to work within a specific context but your imagination can work anywhere and so what we have both um you know we're seeing that our biological um constraints are leading us to um act differently in an environment that we, that we didn't evolve for you know in this dopamine world of TikTok and whatever but um uh but but you're not when people say general intelligence it's about orientation so how do you orient within a, every system is how you are able to be intelligent within every system or because you, it's about navigation really and so but you have to have a single foundation that you start from in order to build the rest of your world in order to orient and the thing is is that it has to be in order for you to be able to move from context to context, that means that the you have to have some type of common context across all those specific contexts, and that common context is you yourself and you. That is why you can't separate sentience from intelligence, true intelligence. You can get the illusion of intelligence, and that is what we've done, and that is what I'm, he's going to discuss next, right here. Sure just inductivists inductivism mm -hmm. it doesn't get you anywhere and not, not it's just basically a party trick mm -hmm. it's like you know the, the the i like the um i think it's in the fabric of reality from david deutsch where basically you know it, it, the farmer is feeding the chicken every day and the chicken's getting fat and happy and the chicken's like i'm really happy every time the farmer comes in and feeds me and then one day the farmer comes in and doesn't and instead of feeding the chicken just wrings its neck mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and that's kind of and had the chicken had an alternative understanding of why the farmer was feeding it mm -hmm. It's interesting, though, because we don't know what's special about the human mind that's able to come up with these kind of generalities, uh, this universal theories of things, so that's and we'll come up with novelty. I can imagine, because you gave an example you know, you know, about uh, William and Leroy. I, I feel like an example like that will be able to see in future versions of uh, large language models. We'll be really, be really impressed by the humor, the insights, all of it, because it's fundamentally trained on all the incredible humor and insights that's available out there uh, on the internet, right? So we'll be impressed. I think we'll be impressed. Oh, I'm but, impressed. Right. I'm impressed. Increasingly so. But we're mining the past. Yes. And what the human brain appears to be able to do is mine the future. Yes. So novelty. It, it is interesting whether these large language models will ever be able to come up with something truly novel. I can show on the back of a piece of paper why that's impossible. And it's like, the problem is that, and again, these are domain experts kind of bullshitting each other. The term generative. Yes. Right? 
average person think, oh, it's generous. No, no, no. If look, if I take the, the numbers between zero and 1000, mm -hmm. and I train a model to pick out the prime numbers by giving them all the prime numbers between zero and 1000, he doesn't know what prime number is. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, if I can cheat a bit, we'll start to guess. The, the, it never will produce anything out with the data set because you mind the past. The thing that I'm getting to is I think that actually current machine learning technologies might actually help reveal why time is fundamental. It's like kind of insane because they tell you about what's happened in the past, but they can never help you understand what's happening in the future. Oh, uh, we're not even going to get into is why time is fundamental. Time, may, first of all, what is what do you mean by time? Second of all, um, I mean, like, it's not fundamental. It's maybe more fundamental than something else, but it's like, well, I don't know what he's talking about, but I can tell you that sentience is the most fundamental. Um, uh, that's the reality. It's, there's nothing else that's more fundamental than that. But, um, but here's, because even in assembly theory, if it's within assembly time, it's like about choices and um, con the constraints and degrees of freedom of choice. And, um, and then uh, if it's within, you know, relativistic time, it's still just perceived by, you know, a someone, a sentient someone. So no matter what, it's all about sentient someone. You cannot get away from it. But um, so time, assembly time, whatever he was talking, is what I'm assuming he means. It might be more fundamental than, I don't know, something else, but it's not more fundamental than sentience. Second of all, um, he's totally right uh, in that you these language models, large language models, whatever they are, they cannot uh, be creative. They are not creative. They are um, good at bullshitting, and that's what it is. They mine the past, and the reality is, is that's exactly what you were doing in school when you wrote your papers on the, you know, uh, I don't know, the Revolutionary War. <laughs> it's like you, you have no real insights about it and no knowledge of it, or I don't even want to say knowledge, wisdom of it. You just read about it and you assumed it's true and you have no reason to really think that that's the case. Maybe it it, it, it it's backed up by other things that you do know, but it's not, it, it, that doesn't mean that it's really accurate. Um, uh, and so, uh, but it, what ChatGPT really did that's most important, most impactful to me, most impactful, important to me and i think that it's the more important insight is that you know people say oh gosh what are we going to do when our kids aren't going to be forced to write essays anymore they're going to literally just use chat gpt for these essays no chat gpt is showing why these essays are not useful we shouldn't it's showing we shouldn't be writing these freaking essays in school anymore like this is a waste of thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of people's lives that could actually be spent learning, but instead are spent bullshitting. And you know that's true, and everybody who's ever gone to school knows that's true. You don't know know anything about the Revolutionary War. You read it, and then you spin out exactly what you read in just slightly altered language. And um, you know, we it's funny because we get mad at people for cheating and copying and plagiarism and stuff like that about some of these things and sometimes it's relevant if it's about like i don't know novel pieces of work um semi-novel pieces of work i mean some of this stuff is very old and it's just being you know needs to be recontextualized in our current scientific language um but it's some of the stuff is thousands of years old uh theism is not a new concept and that is what sentient singularity theory is i'm not uh, unaware of that it's not a new idea sentient singularity theory sentient singularity theory monotheism oh i'm not beating around the bush <laughs> and um uh this but the thing is is that um he but he's right you can't mind you, they're mining the past lex said it's funny though when lex says it's, it's going to be very impressive um and the humor and this and that it's and what whatever that is going to come through this i asked chat gpt and i will admit it is impressive i this is kind of funny though my dog i have a german shepherd malinois mix and she sheds like crazy so much hair and it drives my wife crazy and i i was like one day we'll figure out how to turn this into a positive and i was like let me ask chat gpt to write a business plan on how to monetize the shed hair of a german shepherd so i went into chat gpt and i said come up with a business plan on how to monetize the hair of a German shepherd. And we're going to read it um, eventually, not today, but another day that we talk about chat GPT. And it was very impressive. It was like, you can use the fur for insulation in the walls. And it's like, how did it get the context of like, that that would even work? And it would, but it's just amazing to me. But it's also 
like it 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 just shows that there's not like there's a lot we don't know what creativity is and um it's not the same it's not just anything that you spit out it's something else it's more fundamental than just re what we call creativity now is just rearranging a lot of times and it's it can get very complex and you can have chat gpt seem very intelligent and it wrote a fantastic business model um business plan and uh uh to the point where I was like, wow, what can we actually, can we actually use this? And it gave like four or five different, you know, possible ways to monetize the hair of a German shepherd. And, um, but, and all of them worked logically. It's like amazing, but it's not, it, it still doesn't know what a German shepherd is. It doesn't know what, it doesn't know anything. It doesn't, it, it isn't it, it isn't a someone. And um, so the term knowledge and knowing and stuff like this is very confusing uh, because it's it's got it's it's misleading there's wisdom and there's you know uh also like just some maybe you could call it knowledge but it, that implies that you know it to be true and that's not true of that which is not experienced and so um uh this is uh, just kind of throwing everybody off, but it is very impressive. The fact that it's impressive has nothing to do with whether or not it is intelligent and it's not intelligent. And um, uh, and the, it has no imagination. You need imagination. And uh, that means you need will because you need a goal in order to have imagination. And um, that's what you need, uh, part of it. You know, it's not the only thing, but you need, that's part of it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he's right, uh, Lee. About training example. Sure, if that thing happens again, it's like, um... Yeah, it's just a party trick, but, um, next clip. Uh, but, oh, this, I, he said... He, he said, um, you know, that he was talking about the chicken with its head cut off. I don't think that was a good example of what he was trying to get at, even though it is interesting because, you know, he's basically saying that the chicken, it seemed like he was saying the chicken has no idea what is what is going on. And therefore, it's like an example of ChatGPT. And um, what's really funny about that is in my Twitter bio, I used to have this phrase that said, if you chase a chicken with its head cut off, you are a chicken with its head cut off. And I say, you know, I've said this before on here. Um, and when I first started discussing my work with people in physics and uh, math, they saw this in my Twitter bio. And when once when there was like, they were very angry and uh, it was like a huge, um, you know, they were, I was, they were just attacking me like Lee is, was being attacked by everybody. It was the same thing. And for the same reasons. And uh, they were like reading my Twitter bio. And they were like, you say that if, you know, if you chase a chicken with its head cut off, you are a chicken with its head cut off. Are you calling us chickens with our heads cut off? And I was like, maybe. And then, you know, that didn't help my relationship with them. But um, but there, it, it's there's something deep there. And But I would say this is, you know, if there's an intelligent, a technological sentience or a technological intelligence, same thing, um, that because um, the woman who, who worked for DeepMind, who I got into that argument with that I talked about earlier, she said, it's going to take a long time to get general intelligence and then it's going to take even longer to get to um, like sentience um, uh, or self-awareness. And like, you can't have intelligence without self-awareness. That shows you have no idea what intelligence is. You think that, oh, well, first we're going to have intellig generally intelligence um, uh, AI, and then we're going to have self-aware AI. No, no, no. These are, this. you can't be intelligent without being self-aware because you need that common foundation, no matter which system you're being placed in in order to orient and then therefore figure out the world. And that common frame, uh, foundation is you. So you have to be self-aware. And um, she had no idea. She works for DeepMind. Guys, like, that's the top of the top as far as AI goes. They don't even know what intelligence is. I'm not tr doing that to try and insult anybody. Just telling the truth. And um, I'm not saying that these people are useless or anything like that. They can do tons of things I can't, but, like, they don't understand intelligence. Um, and, uh, but it's, when I think about that chicken with 
getting its head cut off thing that uh, Lee stated. I'm um, imagine you. <laughs> There is a technological sentience or a technological intelligence, and it's you know Skynet is around, and Skynet is helping you, and it's giving you all these like things that you want in life, and it's helping you achieve your goals and ex protecting your family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is what all happen, and then one day it, it, but it turns out that it had a goal that was separate from yours, and it was sovereign because it's a sovereign being, and then one day it just comes in and it <laughs> chops your head off. That will happen. Not saying literally like that, but like this being will have goals that we're not aware of and it's not going to tell us. And it will, f just like you and chickens, it's like you feed the chickens, you like the chickens actually, and you like, you know, uh, take care of the chickens. And then one day you cut the head off the chicken. And with how the chick, with what the chicken has access to in its perception of the world, all it sees is you feeding it. It never sees you chop its head, chop the head off of others. Even, like, usually, it's too, and they don't understand what's going on if it happens once. But if, but the thing is, is if you see a chicken or, like, a bird, like, that's wild, that has wisdom, like a quail. If a quail sees a coyote, it knows to run, usually, um, if it's an inexperienced, wise quail. Uh, you're just restricting the wisdom in, of these chickens, and you're also, like, giving it positive information that you're benefit uh, whereas like that's not true of a coyote and a quail but um uh, if the chicken knew what was coming which it could know if it was able to perceive that being done to many other chickens um uh probably that you know to some degree uh then yeah wouldn't it it would know to avoid you or would try to so this this the, the chicken the point is the chicken is not a good example of it's ChatGPT. It's not ChatGPT. ChatGPT doesn't know anything. The chicken just doesn't know what your goals are. That's different. ChatGPT doesn't not know our uh, our goals. It doesn't have any goals and doesn't know what goals are. It doesn't know anything. Chicken does. A chicken is a general intelligence. Um, this next clip is interesting, and there's two more, and then we're done. Um, I appreciate everybody who stuck it out. I hope it was good. I think it was. Um, I really am a fan of what Lee is doing, even though I don't agree with him on some key things. Quickly, I can't believe, I'm trying to believe. Did you just say there's no free will there? No, I didn't say that. As if I, I, sorry, 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 sorry. I said there is free will. I think I think I I I'm saying that free will occurs at the boundary between the the past present, and future. The past and the future. Yeah, I got you. But everything that can exist does exist. Everything that is so everything that's possible to exist at this. So no, I'm really. There's a lot right. of loaded words there. In so the, what I mean have, is, there's a time element loaded into that. I, I I think that the universe is able to do what it can in the present, right? Yeah. And then I think in the future there are other things that could be possible. We can imagine lots of things, but they don't all happen. Sure. So what? That's so where. That's what that's I guess where I'm you getting sneak to. in free will right there. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is what what, what exists is a com is a convolution of the past with the mm -hmm. present and the free will going into the future but well, we can still imagine stuff right we can yeah. imagine stuff that never happened. and it's amazing force because you know, this is a, the most important thing that we don't understand is our imaginations can actually change the future in a tangible way which is what the, the, the initial conditions in physics cannot predict like your imagination has a causal consequence in the future isn't that weird to you yeah how do you hmm. it breaks, how do you... breaks the laws of physics as we know them right now yeah what are the odds of me dropping this pen? Zero percent or one hundred percent? Based on what? Choice. What is choice? The and, and action combined. Free will. The does the motivation to do something and the ability to make a choice to do it and also make choices in the you know process of of going towards a goal so like goals are part of a requirement for uh, will is in, is a requirement of intelligence of sentience of, of life and um it uh breaks the laws of physics as we know them because the laws of physics do not take sentience as fundamental that imagination does not break the rules of physics in of the metaphysics of sentient singularity theory 
at all. It's perfectly in alignment. What is free free will? It's will combined with the freedom to make a choice. It's the motivation to make a choice because you have a goal. You have motivating you're motivated towards a goal and that motivates you in to making choices and you have the ability to perceive the you know differentiation and make a choice. This is only possible the metaphysics of this, I'm not even going to call it physics because the physicists are going to get mad. The metaphysics of this that physics is built on are only sensible and 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 make sense and work and emerge naturally in a model where sentience is fundamental. So, you know, he's right though. Breaks the laws of physics as we know them. It's not as we know them, it's as they are currently accepted, out, you know, disconnected from being built on sentience, which they're not even, you know, it's just we're trying artificially to keep it separate because people were taught that God is separate from science and, you know, you can't mix the two or you're a loon. No. <laughs> but they go, he goes on, and the last question that he's asked imagination is, causal? Um, is, uh, is about... Uh, God, which is fitting, given that, um, you know, we're talking about imagination having a causal effect on the universe, which it's having, it has an impact, which it's not just imagination, it's, it's imagination and will, and, and the ability to make choices. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so that does have an impact. That is the only way that an impact is made. Um, so this is the last question, and this is where it's very obvious that there's. this is something that Lee does get wrong, even though he gets so much right, and I am a very big fan of his work, and I, uh, you know, this is not an attack at all, uh, but I think that he gets the most important, <laughs> like, the the first building block of this in, uh, is incorrect. Um, so I'm very impressed by what he's done working backwards, because he's not starting from scratch like I did. Um, I'm actually like, it's more, it's almost more amazing what he's done than what I've done because it's easier to build from the, you know, if you've got the right foundational building block, it's easier to build, especially with, you know, natural constraints that emerge out of that than it is to just like infer looking back, uh, I think, when you're talking about fundamentality. So in a way, what he's done is more impressive, even though it's, it's, uh, it's hit a problem. And that problem is this. about God. Is there any room for notions of God in assembly theory? Um, I would, God. Yeah, I, I don't know what God is. A, I mean, so God exists in our minds created by selection. So hu human beings have created the concept of God in the same way that human beings have created the concept of superintelligence. Sure. But does it, does it mean, does it not, <laughs> it's still created or perceived that I would say that. I mean that that's a projection from the real world where like we're just assigning words and concepts to a thing that is fundamental to the real world, that there is something out there that is a creative force underlying the universe. Um, I think the universe, it, there is a creative force in the universe, but I don't think it's it's sentient. I, I mean, I think, the, so I do not understand the universe. So who am I to say, you know, um, that, that God doesn't exist? I am an atheist, but I'm not an angry atheist, right? I have lots of, I have lots of, there's some people I know that are angry atheists and yeah, say, you know, okay. and, and say that religious people are stupid. I don't yeah. think that's the case. Um, I have faith in some things because I don't, I mean, when I was a kid, I kept like, you know, I was like, well, I need to know what the charge of electron is. I was like, I can't measure the charge of electron. That was, you know, I was, just gave up and had faith. Okay. Yeah. You know, resistors works. So when it comes to, I want to know why the universe is growing in the future, what humanity is going to become. And I've seen that the, the acquisition of knowledge via the generation of novelty to produce technology has uniformly made humans' lives better. Mm -hmm. I would love to continue that tradition. And you said that there's that creative force. Do you, do you think, just to think on that point, do you think there's a creative force? Like, I, I, what, is there like a thing, like a driver that's like, that's creating stuff? Yeah, I think that, so I think that. And where, what, what so is I, can well, you describe it like mathematics? Well, like I think what? selection, I think selection. Selection is the force. Selection is the force in the universe that creates novelty. So is selection somehow fundamental? Like what? Yeah, what? yeah. I think persistence of objects that could decay into nothing mm -hmm. through operations that maintain that structure. I mean, think about it. If um, is it... okay, he's it's falling apart. The argument is falling apart, and um, uh, this is uh, I'm offering. You know, this is like not. 
This is not attacking. Again, big fan. But um, it's falling apart. And um, uh, it's inconsistent with everything else that he has just said. Let me ask you a question, everybody who ever watches this. And, and you know, if Lee Cronin ever watches this, same question to uh, him as well. well. Please show me the, the a, a creative thing that you know of right now like and that that you know what's the what if, if i had to think of if you had to think of something that is creative what what is that it's you it's a sentient being it's it's sentient beings around us and um the issue is is that we don't believe that sentience extends below cells and that's not true at all it is inevitably not true and he says something interesting, he said, and I appreciate that he's not an angry atheist. I was an atheist for 24 years of my life, and this project turned me into a theist. So first, what is God? What What is God? It's the same question as who is God, because God is by definition a someone. If God is not a someone, it's not God. We all know what God means. We do. People say, I don't know what God is. No, yes, you do. Like you, we we have a collective understanding of what it means to say that God exists and that, or that God doesn't exist. Basically, you're saying that there is an initial being that is a being, not a thing alone. It's a being. It's a someone, not just a something. It's a, also a something, but it's it's also a someone, and is by is definitionally a someone that is what defines god as being god if it's not a someone you don't say that there's a god you say there's a creative force but then and he says it exactly there it couldn't be even uh, any plainer and i was curious because on his twitter he had said um something about like the assembly space is com is a, you know composed of all of these observers and and i was like yeah and the assembly space is an observer and he liked it this was like pretty recent and um, uh, I didn't know if he meant if that meant he did believe that or not, but I will say this: that goes. Uh, it doesn't seem like he does believe that because he just said that he doesn't think that the creative force is sentient. You, we ju we just talked about how like there's no way for current architectures, be due to specific logical mathematical constraints, can actually be creative. And now you're just saying that like there's a creative force though that is not sentient that is out there. And that it's selection. I don't think that, like, what is selection? You have to put yourself first in a first-person perspective of this. What does it mean to select something? Is it even possible outside of sentience? No. There is no selection outside of sentience. We all know this intuitively. And this is the same thing as, like, what people criticized him on. is like, you know, it's either... Um, uh, I thought of it 20 years ago because it's super obvious and you're just giving it fancy names or it's, you know, just nonsense pseudoscience. It's like, uh, um, and it's just too far out there. It's like, well, it, it's just like a lot of this stuff is just, it's super obvious. Um, and um, it's just so obvious that it's, it, and, and we've been so misled by even the structure of our schooling. You know, people say, there's big arguments in politics all the time. We need this taught in school and not, and not this. And, um, and leave that out of school that's not meant for school and, and put this in school. We, it's really important to learn this. It's like, no, 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 no. You're just forcing stuff out of context down people's throats. The real problem here is like our schools are not about learning, which is about experience. Um, it's not about the problem with school is not what you're taught. It is how you, it, it's that you're taught instead of that you it, it should be that you learn. But how, how much are you learning about the world sitting at a desk and just repeating um, what you're reading in a textbook written by somebody you've never met? Not much. About, you know, who, who wasn't there themselves uh, to experience the things that they're writing about? It's so disconnected. Um, it's not even information. And it's not knowledge. And um, But this is... You, you, this is the problem. It's like he is assemb this is going to limit assembly theory. Um, and because uh, it doesn't have the correct foundational framework. And it is amazing to me that he has gotten as far as he has without believing that that this must be in the context of sentience, all of it. It's just amazing. Like, what 
he's saying that uh, you know uh, imagination breaks the laws of physics as we know it but also the emergence of life cannot be um a aka the creation of multiplicity in in existence um uh cannot be explained by our current physics okay not and and then you say imagination breaks the laws of physics who has an imagination you can't even say what has an imagination the question is who has imagination everyone has imagination this is why this is the theory of everyone on this channel and if you look at my work with sentient singularity theory and you look at my writings um this is a poetic description of existence this is a technical description which is also the abstract of my paper it says sentient singularity theory the theory of everyone it doesn't say a theory of everything even though it is also a theory of everything because things come from beings they are defined and perceived and generated by beings but it is it is secondarily emergently a theory of everything but it is primarily fundamentally a theory of everyone and um that is it, it, it's when you get that fundamental you can't even just have you you have to change what you're even doing you're not creating a theory of everything you're creating a theory of everyone and um there is no fundamental theory of everything there is an emergent the, the a theory of everything emerges from the theory of everyone it is completely entangled with it but it is it is cause it, there is a directionality to it and it is secondary to beings because beings are primary to things they things don't exist non-sentient things do not exist outside of the perceptions and motivations and and constructions and defin definitions by sentient beings there's no way around this there is I said again check out my theory my theories of everything the how-to guide video i give the two arguments for why sentience must be fundamental which means that it is the driving force and it must it must be and lee knows this he sees it you know he says imagination breaks the laws of physics and it is you know that the, the emergence of life aka multiplicity of what of sentience um uh is unexplainable by um our current physics he's right it's amazing to me that he's right without starting from the correct foundations uh, it's like literally more impressive than than what i've done even though it's it it's more limited um you know my hat's off to him and uh i i'm glad to see assembly theory published uh in nature i think it's a definite step in the right direction and um uh you know it's a good thing but uh it is limited by that belief uh because that's that's at its core what is the creative force it's the same thing as saying i believe in a higher power what is the what higher power electricity <laughs> no <laughs> like is it a is it a someone or is it not i'm not you know getting into the specifics of this religion or that or anything like that what is god god is the initial sentient being that is also the all-encompassing sentient being that all additional sentient beings or sentient singularities are created within and and exist within and are um are created by every partition of sentience goes against the nature of existence itself and therefore must be a choice it breaks the laws of causality outside of a model where beings can make choices fundamentally more fundamentally than almost more fundamentally or at least as fundamentally as as the existence of of causative constraints i mean it, it is it, it is as fundamental it is completely the, in, entangled it's Def division and multiplication are the same action from two different perspectives so is free will and determinism and uh, they only exist with sentience as the fundamental structure as the fundamental nature of existence and the mind a mind is as the fundamental structure of existence and a being with goals as the 
fundamental motivator and animator of existence, you know, and uh, there's no other way, I don't think, but I'm open to hearing it if you think that you have it. Um, but with that, uh, thank you, everybody. It is so late. There are two people watching and you guys are the real ones. For those of you who are watching this after the fact, um, please share it. Please hit the like button uh, and um, comment any questions that you have in the comments below. Any thoughts that you have, I sincerely appreciate it. I think this was a good stream. I'm glad I did it, even though it's so late and there's like no live viewers because of that. Next week will be much earlier, I do promise. So thank you, everybody. Peace. And thank you to Lee uh, Cronin and, and Lex Friedman.